We are on the record. This is the digital video deposition of Colleen Hunch testifying in the matter of BR versus County of Orange. Case number 815CV00626, CJC, PJW. This deposition is being held at 3 Park Plaza, Suite 1500, Irvine, California, 92614. Today's date is November 16th, 2017. The time on the video monitor is 1044. My name is Grant Sampson, legal video specialist with Jordan Media Inc. The certified shorthand reporter today is Denise Paholski. Pol All counsel will now state their appearances for the record. The witness may now be sworn in. Sean McMillan appearing for plaintiff. Zachary Schwartz appearing for defendants. William Halleck appearing for defendants. Would you please raise your right hand to be sworn? You do solemnly state that the testimony you may give in the following proceeding <coughs> shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Haunch. Thank Ms. you. Can I stop you for a second? Yeah. Mr. Videographer, could you read the case number for me again? Because what you read didn't seem to jive with my case number. I don't know if that matters, but. 815CV00626. Uh, C J C P J W. Sean, you don't have that, do you? Um, What's the eight one five? Yeah, I don't know what the eight one five is. I have uh, one five or S A C V one five six two six C J C. You know, the eight might be on the E C F caption. They always have that. Yeah, if you look number. at the top left. Okay. Yeah, it's the okay. E C F uh, number. Okay. Perfect. Sorry. That's okay. Threw me off. I don't remember what I was going to ask her. <laughs> I'm getting old, Just man. Good morning. For, forget. Yeah. Good morning. All right. <laughs> We're done. Let's go. Can you please state and spell for me your full name? My name is Colleen Ann Haunch. C O L L E E N. Middle name is A N N. Last name H O N C H. Did they tell you I have horns? I'm sorry, what did you say? Did they tell you I have Objection points? relevance. <laughs> <laughs> no. Attorney client privilege. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, that's all. I wonder what they no, say we, behind we my back. <laughs> all right. What do you uh, presently do? What's your current position with County of Orange? Uh, I'm currently the administrative manager, two of our emergency response one in the Children and Family Services Division of Social Service Agency from the County of Orange. Okay, how long have you been in Administrative Manager 2? Uh, since August of this year, 2017. Oh, okay, so it's a new position. Correct. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Prior to August of this year, what was your position? I was Administrative Manager 1 in Program Integrity in the Administrative Services Division of a Social Service Agency with Orange County Social Services. Program Integrity, what is that? Uh, they handle various su different subjects about fraud, um, appeals from uh, people in the community on like CalWORKs cases. Um, they handle civil rights complaints and claims the grievance review hearing process for children's cases and khakis. Um, <coughs> they do EVES, the income er um, verification system, and um, check for fraud related to like uh, program. Like welfare or something? Like welfare programs. Okay, mm -hmm. I got you. On the, you said they review civil rights complaints. Those are like uh, the ADA disabilities. Complaints, uh, right? In part, yes. Yeah. What other parts are there? Uh, if there's a civil rights complaint made against the <coughs> agency of the 12 protected classes and those um, by a consumer um, that we provide services to, they okay. will investigate those complaints in conjunction with the state of California. Okay, and when you say the 12 protected classes, mm -hmm. again, we're talking about under the uh, the ADA or the Voc Rehab Act, is that correct? And the Division 21 of um, California um, regulations. And the Manual policy and procedures. And regulations and policy and procedures. Manual policy and procedures. As well as the 1964 Civil Rights Act, correct? correct. Okay. And you call that grouping uh, civil rights, correct? 
it's one of the functions of program integrity. Okay. Well, when we say civil rights, that's sort of a broad term. I want to make sure what we're including in that term. Do you include complaints that people make against the county for constitutional violations in this program integrity department where you're dealing with civil rights complaints? Only the complaints against the 12 protected classes have to be impacted. Right. So what we're talking about is the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the ADA, the Voc Rehab Act, and um, I think you said Title 21, right? Uh, it's, it's Division 21. Division 21. Which encompass essentially the discrimination um, civil rights complaints, right? That's my understanding. Right. <clears throat> And what function did you perform when you were over there at Program Integrity? Uh, I was initially the uh, grievance review hearing officer for the uh, child abuse, uh, the khaki um, grievances. How long did you do that? I did that for about a year and a half to two years. And I, I had um, took over the appeals division in the same program. So that would take us back to like 2015 or so? Uh, actually, the first portion of my um, stay there was with the grievance review hearing officer. The second part is the appeals manager. I gotcha. So when did you start over at Program Integrity? It was in June of 2012. Okay, and then you did the CACI review, grievance reviews, for about two years. So that would get you about 2014 or so? Correct. And then you did the, I think you said appeals. appeals. Mm -hmm. And that was all the way through until you transferred over to be an admin two for ER? Correct. Okay. What did you do before that, before June 2012? Uh, I was a supervisor in emergency response, also in um, emergency response one with uh, Children and Family Services, the social <coughs> service agency. Okay. When you were over at Program Integrity, did you oversee or, or do any work related to the work that you were doing as in emergency response? If you understand the question, that was kind of a weird question. What I'm wondering is your duties when you were at Program Integrity, did they entail any oversight whatsoever over emergency response workers? Oversight? No. Okay. Did you have any supervisory duties over any emergency response workers whatsoever when you were in program integrity? No. Okay. So going back to your time as a supervisor in emergency response one, when did that start? It was in, um, I believe it was in 2012. So about the same time that you, okay. How long were you in emergency response as a supervisor? Two years. So that would bring us to 2014? Correct. And then you transferred up to uh, program integrity. In 2014, in June 2014. Okay. When, so you did this for about two years then as a ER supervisor? Yes. <clears throat> what did you do before you were an emergency response supervisor? I was a supervisor in specialized family services the continuating court program for uh, CFS and Social Service Agency. Okay, specialized Family Services, what exactly were you doing there? Uh, I was supervising a medical unit. What does that mean? Um, we supervised uh, con kids who were involved in the court process, um, the continuing court program, who had medical issues. Okay, so that was, are you familiar with the term continuing services? Yes. Was that a continuing services unit? Yes. Okay, so that would be, have been 
your role there, or at least your unit's role there, would have been after children had been detained and the court process had been initiated and some decisions had been made about how to deal with the child or the family, your unit would pick up delivering whatever services were ordered by the court. Is that right? Correct. Okay. How long did you do that? Uh, approximately five years. So would that bring us back to like 2007? Seven. So you started in 2007 as a supervisor there? Yes. And continued there as a supervisor until 2012? Yes. Okay. That was not an emergency response unit, correct? Correct. As part of your regular job duties and the regular job duties of your subordinates, they did not actually go out and seize children. They did on occasion, I'm sure, but that wasn't part of their regular function. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Their regular function was delivering services as ordered by the court. Yes. Okay. What did you do before 2007? Uh, before 2007, I was a senior social worker in emergency response one with children and family services through the social service agency. Okay. When did you start in that position? 2004. And you maintained that position until 2007, I presume? Correct. What did you do, and just so that we're clear, in emergency response, that would be the unit where your regular job duties would be to investigate referrals and where you deemed it necessary seize children from their homes. Yes, that's correct. Okay. <clears throat> and am I correct that during the time period that you were there, 2004 to 2007, there was no warrant process or warrant procedure available to you by which you could even obtain a warrant if you wanted one? Correct. Okay. In fact, that didn't come into place until March 2010, correct? I don't know the exact date. I wasn't in the program at that period of time. Well, you manage the program now. You're an administrative manager two in ER1, correct? Yes. Did you get any training when you took up that position as an administrative manager two in ER1? Have I received any training since I became the manager? Is, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm let, clear let your question. Sure, let me try again. Um, I know that you get, uh, you guys call it something different. I was just doing a San Diego depot. They call it SWIT training. What do you guys call your core training up here when you first get hired on? Uh, they have SWIT and core training as a, for the senior social worker classification. Okay, so Each you guys classification SWIT. has a training. Okay, so you guys have SWIT training too. <clears throat> okay, when were you first hired on in any capacity with uh, CFS? December 1st of 2000. And in what capacity were you hired on in December of 2000? Senior social worker. What unit? I worked for the uh, Integrated Continuing Services Unit. That's very similar um, to what you were doing from 2007 to 2012, at least the unit did similar work? Similar work except uh, for the types of families served or children served. Right, you weren't uh, dealing with, you know, children with specialized medical needs. Correct. Right. So again, we would be in 2000 in the integrated, what'd you call it? In integrated, integrated continuing services. Integrated. ICS. ICS. I like that better. In the ICS unit, again, you were, your primary job duties were to deliver services to your clients as ordered by the court. Correct. Okay. And when we say deliver services to your clients, your clients would be the children and the parents, the families that were in your system. Yes. Okay. How long did you do that? Uh, from my higher date through 2004 to my next assignment. And your next assignment was? The emergency response senior social worker classification we just spoke about. Okay. 
Now, when you first got hired on, you had some training, correct? Correct. Was that SWIT, core, what'd you guys call that? Um, I think they just call it core at the time. And the core training, that covered, it was sort of broad training, right? It covered many different subject areas. Correct. Okay. And how long did it last? Don't recall exactly, but it was several, a couple months spread out. And that core training, that's training that all um, government social workers with County of Orange are required to participate in before they actually go out in the field and do work. Is that right? Correct. Now, the core training back in 2000 when you were hired, it did not have a component dealing with removal warrants, correct? Correct. It didn't even have a component dealing with search warrants at that point in time, correct? Correct. Okay. Those came about much later, right? Yes. Okay. So when you transferred in 2004 to the ER unit, did you have to undergo any further training before you could start performing the job functions that you needed to perform in an ER capacity, emergency response? I received on-the-job training from my supervisor and peers who were doing the job. You didn't receive any uh, formalized training, like where you sit down and maybe county council presents you a PowerPoint or a lecture or maybe some role play, something like that? We have ongoing trainings all the time, but I don't recall any individual training other than that, uh, like by a county council member individually training me. Okay. Back when you switched positions, we're talking about a very specific time frame from 2000 and 2004, did you have any formalized training related to what your new job duties would be as an emergency response worker? I was trained by my supervisor and by my peers who were doing the job already. So it was on the job training. Okay, so you didn't have any formalized training. Classroom training Correct. is what you're referring to. Well, let me back up a little bit. This core training that you had when you were first hired on. Yes. How would you describe that? It was a uh, classroom training. Okay, so it was formalized. There were papers, documents handed out, PowerPoints presented, lecturers, things like that. Yes. Did you have anything like that? when you took up this position with emergency response? No. Okay. And I'm correct, aren't I, that in 2004, when you transferred over to emergency response, there was no procedure in place by which you could even obtain a removal warrant if you wanted one. Correct. Same with respect to a search warrant. There was no procedure in place yet in 2004 by which you could obtain a search warrant. Correct. Okay. Same with respect to medical examinations of children. There was no procedure in place in 2004 by which you could even obtain a warrant to do a forensic medical evaluation of a child. Objection relevance. Go ahead. Correct. Same with respect to school interviews. In 2004, when you picked up your job in emergency response, there was no process or procedure in place by which you could even obtain a warrant to do a school interview of a child. Objection relevance. Go ahead. Correct. Okay. And I think you said you stayed with emergency response until 2007, is that right? Yes. By the time you left, when in 2007 did you leave emergency response? It was January of 2007. Okay, January. So by the time you left emergency response in January of 2007, I'm correct, aren't I, that as of that point in time, there was no process or procedure in place yet by which you could obtain a warrant to remove a child from the custody of its parents? Correct. Similarly, I'm correct, aren't I, that as of January 2007, there was no process in place by which you could obtain a warrant to conduct a search of a child or a search of a home. Correct. 
Am I also correct that by January 2007, there was no process in place by which you could obtain a warrant to conduct a forensic medical exam or a forensic interview of a child? Objection relevance. Go ahead. Correct. Am I also correct that by January 2007, when you left emergency response, there was no process in place for a social worker to seek or obtain a warrant to conduct a school interview of a child? Objection relevance. Go ahead. Correct. Okay. So am I also correct then that between 2004 and January of 2007, when you left emergency response, you would have received no training whatsoever on how to obtain a warrant for any of those classifications we just spoke about? Correct. And that's mainly because there was no process in place to do it, right? Yes. Okay. Then you left emergency response and you moved on to specialized, specialized family services, right? Yes. And that's a continuing, yeah, continuing services unit, but for kids with special medical needs, right? Yes. Did you receive any formalized training whatsoever when you made that transfer to specialized family services? Objection, vague and ambiguous as to formalized training. Okay, let's go back to the very beginning. I thought we dealt with this, maybe not. Well, you just want you to specify the training topic that you're referring to. Any formalized training that okay. related to a new right. job. That's fine, go ahead. I received um, supervisor core training. Was that the first time that you received supervisor core training? Yes. What is supervisor core training? Uh, <clears throat> trainings deal mostly about being a new supervisor and how to manage staff and carry out certain functions that is expected of a supervisor. Okay. When did you undertake that training? I don't recall the date, <laughs> excuse me, but this was is after that um, I was promoted sometime in 2007. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. No problem. At any point it. you need to get some water, coffee, whatever, just let me know and we'll take a break. Yeah, I do have a paralyzed vocal cord, so it does take me, I have to, have to drink more water when I'm talking a lot. Not a problem. Clear at all. my voice a little bit. I, I'm, I'm sleep impaired, so I have to drink coffee <laughs> when we're doing this. It's not a, not a big deal. <coughs> See, now you have me coughing. Mm. Um, hmm. When you did the transfer to Specialized Family Services, did you get promoted as part of that transfer? Or was it, was your... Yes, that was a promotion. Okay. So the transfer is when you actually got promoted to a supervisor? Yes. Okay. Can you estimate for me roughly how long it was from January 2007 when you got promoted to the point in time that you took the supervisor court training? Just an estimate's fine. Three months. Okay, so by maybe March, end of March, beginning of April, something like that? Correct. Okay. April. So I think we're still good there. Am I correct that no part of your supervised court training related in any way to any requirements to obtain a warrant to search a home or search a child? Yes. Okay. Am I also correct that no part of your supervisor core training in 2007 related in any way to requirements that warrants be obtained under certain circumstances to remove children from the custody of their parents? Yes. Am I also correct that no part of your supervisor core training related in any way to the necessity that under certain circumstances a warrant be obtained to conduct a forensic medical examination or forensic interview of a child? Objection relevance. Yes. Am I also correct that no part of your core training, supervisor core training, related in any way to the necessity to obtain a warrant to conduct a school interview of a child? Objection, relevance. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. And 
in part, the reason for that is because, at least as of late March or early April 2007, there still was no process in place by which any of those warrants could be obtained. Can you repeat the time frame, please? Yeah, it would have been uh, January 2007 through late March, early April 2007, the time when you took this core training. That there was? No process or procedure in place by which a social worker in that unit could even seek or obtain a warrant. That is correct. Okay. And then you were there until 2012. At any point in time between 2007, that when you took the supervisor core training, and 2007, <coughs> or 2012 rather, when you promoted, did you ever receive any formalized training regarding any type of warrant requirements or procedures? No. Okay. And is that in part because as a supervisor in specialized family services, your job duties did not encompass situations where you would actually need to get a warrant to do something? That'd be correct. Yeah, and that's, that's because for your unit, your unit would normally only be providing services if the court were already involved with the family, right? Correct. Yeah. And then you transferred in 2012 at some point to ER1 as a supervisor, is that right? Yes. Do you remember when in 2012 you transferred to the ER unit? I think it was approximately June. Did you have any formalized training when you transferred from specialized family services over to emergency response? No, okay. for defining formalized as you defined it to me previously. Well, let's make sure that we're clear on this. When I say formalized training, what is it you think that I'm talking about? I think that you're talking about like our core training that we, they send us to, um, that type of training. Okay, so classroom training. Uh, not just classroom, but something formalized like set up with a curriculum with several different topics and okay. perhaps an extensive days. Okay, did you have any sort of training when you transferred from specialized family services to emergency response that was in a classroom setting? We I did attend various trainings throughout my time in each um, each division that I'm in, we always have ongoing trainings. Okay, let me, let me try this a different way, because I recognize that in each specific unit, because each unit has different functions, there may be some ongoing training within that unit addressing the functions that that unit typically performs. Is that right? Yes. So when you say we have ongoing trainings, for example, at Specialized Family Services, you might have trainings frequently dealing with specialized medical needs, right? Correct but they wouldn't necessarily deal with what other units are doing, right? Correct. So for example, when you're in specialized family services as a supervisor, you're not going to be getting ongoing training regarding what a supervisor would be doing over in emergency response, right? Yes. Okay, so when you went into emergency response, when you, the first day you showed up there, did you have any training regarding what you would now be doing as an emergency response supervisor? Or did that come later? Just training. Um, by, I guess, again, on the job training by peers and my manager at the time. Was there any point in time 
from 2012 to 2014 when you left the emergency response unit, was there any point in time where you actually had formalized training? And by formalized, I mean in a classroom setting where somebody's presenting PowerPoint slides to you, for example. Yes. Okay, when was that? Uh, I don't recall all the training dates and topics, but we'd routinely have uh, trainings at all staffs or if uh, the manager had identified training needs, those would be um, presented to the staff. Do you recall having warrant training at any point in time between 2012 and 2014? Yes. Okay. When? When did you get that warrant training? I don't recall the date, but I believe it was in 2012. Okay. Was it before your first day as an emergency response supervisor? No. Okay. Was it within the first month of the time that you became an emergency response supervisor? I don't recall the date. Okay. Can you give me an estimate? First quarter? It was in... Winter? I believe it was in 2012. So your best estimate is sometime that year? Yes. Okay. Let's see if you tell us somewhere in your declaration when it was you learned these things. So I'm going to mark as Exhibit A to your deposition, your declaration. I presume you've already got copies of that, but now you have one more. I appreciate that. I don't have an extra, I'm sorry. I've got it. I assumed you did, that's why I didn't bring a gob of them. Why don't you take a moment and look through that uh, Exhibit A for me. I just, my first question is going to be, is that a true, accurate, complete copy of the declaration that you signed in relation to the County of Orange's opposition to plaintiff's motion for class certification? And just sort of verify that I didn't tamper with it or do some funny thing. Yes, that is a true, accurate, and complete um, copy of the declaration that you signed in this case? That is correct. Okay. And you see on page 7, bottom of the page, line 23, says, I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California that the foregoing is true and correct. Did I read that right? Yes. And there is no qualification there, is there? No. Okay. And that's your signature there at the bottom, line 27? It is. So you talked about the many, many trainings that you've had when you were with the County of Orange these last, what is that, like 17 years? Right? Yes. Did, any, did you ever learn in any of those trainings that the unqualified statement of that which one does not know to be true is the legal equivalent of a statement of that which one knows to be false? No. Nobody ever taught you that? 
not in the way you just said said it. I guess I don't understand, perhaps. Okay. Have you ever read Penal Code Section 125? No. In your capacity as a social worker these many years, though, you've signed many documents under penalty of perjury, haven't you? Yes. Okay. And yet nobody's ever taught you that when you make an unqualified statement under penalty of perjury where you don't know the facts, that's the same as lying. Objection, relevance, argumentative. Nobody's ever taught you that. I guess it hasn't been said in those terms, but what signing penalty of perjury means that those are the facts and the truth as you know it at the time of the written document was created. Yeah, has anybody ever taught you that in order to make an unqualified statement under penalty of perjury, you must have personal knowledge of the facts? Anybody ever taught you that? In these many, many trainings you've had these 17 years? You have to have a personal knowledge of what occurred or what the facts were, yes. So you have learned that? Yes. Okay. When you make a statement that says something to the effect of based on information and belief, mm -hmm. that's not personal knowledge, is it? That's personal knowledge that I've gained, yes. Personal knowledge you've gained how? From talking to other people? Yes. Who they may know personally, right? Who they may know personally or other people who may have uh, witnessed that event. Okay. Okay, so that's like third-hand knowledge that you're obtaining by talking to these people, right? Objection, argumentative. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. You would agree with me that knowledge that you derive second or third-hand is not the equivalent of your personal knowledge. It's learned knowledge, right? Yes. Okay. So you understand that when you make a declaration under penalty of perjury based on learned knowledge, that if you don't make a qualification in your perjury statement, you've got a problem with Penal Code Section 125. You understand that? Objection, argumentative, calls for a legal conclusion. I, I, don't, under, I don't understand that, no. Okay. But we do know if we look here at your declaration, page 7, lines 23 through 25, there is no qualification whatsoever there, correct? Objection calls for a legal conclusion as to what is a sufficient qualification. I, I guess I don't understand what you mean by qualification. Well, do you tell the reader, I mean, I, I'm reading this thing, do you tell me anywhere in here under this lines 23 through 24 that, hey, Sean, by the way, I don't have personal knowledge of these things. I had to go out and interview people to learn knowledge. Do you tell me that? Or, or words to that effect. I don't care. I'm what. saying that what I wrote and what is in my declaration, uh, to my knowledge, is true. Where do the words, Correct. to my knowledge, appear there? Can you point believe, that out I for I believe me? them to be true. Where does that say, where's, where does that appear? Objection, argumentative. Document speaks for itself. Let, let's read it together because I don't see, based on my knowledge or I believe them to be true, what I see, and correct me if I'm wrong, I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California that the foregoing is true and correct, and then there's nothing else to that sentence. Did I read that right? You read it correct. Okay. So there's nothing in there that says, I believe this is true, or based on my research, I believe this is true, right? Correct. Specifically lines 23 through 24 of page 7? Yep. Okay. And in fact, let's go to the first page. Line 23 through 24. I have personal knowledge of the facts set forth in, herein except where otherwise stated, and if called upon, could testify or could competently testify there too. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. So let's talk about some of the things in here that you have personal knowledge of. Let's 
talk about the definitions. The various forms of potential circumstances that would apply to the work that you're doing as an emergency response worker now from when you were, what was that, 2012 to 2014 when you were supervising emergency response workers. The legal definitions you would be concerned about would be the definitions of neglect, definitions of severe neglect, child abuse, things like that, right? Yes. And those are typically defined under the Penal Code and the Welfare and Institutions Code, correct? Yes. Okay. What is the definition of neglect? Neglect um, is... Hold, the... hold, hold on, don't read the document. I want to, I want to probe your memory first. And if it okay. turns out that you have a problem with it, then we'll go to the document. Okay. So go ahead. And it's a, a negligent treatment or maltreatment of a child. In order to qualify as neglect, is there a requirement that severe bodily injury be something that's going to immediately come about as a result of that negligent treatment? For severe neglect? Or? No, the neglect definition you just gave me. No. Okay. So let me make sure I'm correct. Under the penal code definition of neglect, that would include situations that will not necessarily immediately lead to severe bodily injury or death of a child, right? Correct. Okay. In fact, what you say here in your declaration is that neglect is defined as the negligent treatment or maltreatment of a child by a person responsible for the child's welfare under circumstances indicating harm or threatened harm to the child's health or welfare and then the term includes both acts and omissions on the part of the responsible person. Did I read that right? Yes. Okay. Now when it's talking about harm or threatened harm, what level of harm is that? According to your training and your understanding. If the child's uh, safety um, or physical well-being would be endangered. So it doesn't have to be immediate danger, at least not by this definition. Correct. Okay. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be severe bodily injury or death, right? Correct. Okay. So you would agree with, well, let me ask you this first, because you may not agree with me, but I want to make sure, and if you don't, then we've got a bunch of documents we can help refresh your recollection. You'd agree with me, wouldn't you, that in order to lawfully seize a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant, a social worker must, at the time of the seizure of the child, be in possession of specific and articulable facts to show that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death, and there is no lesser intrusive means of averting that specific injury. You'd agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. So you agree with me that we can't take a child from its parents without first getting a warrant under circumstances where we have some threatened harm that's not immediate? Correct. Okay. So under the penal code definition of neglect, you would agree with me that that encompasses circumstances where there's no immediate danger to the child, right? Yes. So we wouldn't be able to take the child without getting a warrant, right? If there's no immediate danger to the child, correct. No immediate danger of bodily severe harm. bodily injury. Not just bodily harm, but severe bodily harm, right? Yes. And even then, before we take that child, we have to explore whether or not there are lesser intrusive ways of protecting the child from that specific injury, right? Correct. But there is a possibility that where we're looking at a neglect situation that the child may be in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death, right? Yes. Okay. So in those very narrow circumstances, it would be appropriate to seize the child without first getting a warrant? 
Uh, they, yes. Okay. But we'd have to explore those lesser intrusive alternative means first, right? Correct. Okay. And you learned that, all of that actually, sometime after June 2012. No, I learned that. I knew that previously. Well, let's explore that because we kind of talked a little bit about warrants, right? Yes. Okay, and we know that you didn't learn anything about warrants from 2000 until, I guess, 2000. Was it 2007? No, it couldn't have been 2007. Was it 2010? I believe it was 2012. 2012. Okay. So am I correct then that in the context of the training that you had prior to 2012, since you didn't learn anything about warrants, well, let me ask this first. Did you learn at some point, actually any point since uh, 2000, since you were first hired on, that unwarranted seizures of children from parents are presumptively unlawful? No. Okay. Did you learn that unwarranted mm -hmm. seizures of children from their parents are presumptively unreasonable? No. Never learned that, right? Even to today. Correct. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm correct. Part of your job duties now as an administrative manager level two in an ER unit is to ensure that your workers are adequately trained, correct? Yes. Okay. And you'd agree with me that by adequately trained, that includes trained on the law that applies to the work they do. Yes. Okay. And I just want to make sure I'm right on this. To your knowledge as an administrative manager 2 over ER1, you have not, or the county has not yet trained you or any of your workers that unwarranted seizures of children are presumptively unreasonable. Correct. Okay. What they have trained you is that in order to lawfully remove a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant, there has to be reasonable articulable evidence to show that the child's in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it would... So the child's in immediate danger of suffering... Severe bodily injury or death. Actually, let me just start over. What they have trained you is that in order to lawfully seize a child from the custody of its parents, at the time of the seizure, you have to be in possession of specific and articulable facts to show that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it takes to get a warrant, correct? Correct. Okay. In, let's focus for a minute on in the time it takes to get a warrant. That's the training, right? Yes. Verbatim, right? I, I don't know if it's verbatim. Let, let me help you. <laughs> I think this is the one. almost an hour. Do you want to take a short break while you look at that? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That works. Okay. We are off. 
the record at 11.33. We are back on the record at 11.45. I'm going to show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 132 to your deposition. And Bill, that's got Bates numbers C012335 through and including C012347. First, what exhibit number is that? Uh, 132. Is that an excerpt? Uh, no, that, I think that's the whole thing. It's the Carolyn Frost stuff. Well, a piece of the Carolyn Frost stuff, but I think this is the that whole section of the training. I don't think you guys bookmarked it, so I had to go through and like manually figure it out. So let me ask you, actually take a moment to look through that. There's a couple pages I dog-eared and highlighted for you. That's what we're going to be focusing on uh, for now. And I just did that to make it easy on you. <clears throat> and just let me know when you're done and ready. You'll probably pick that up. <laughs> Censor it. Yeah. I always have to try to remember that we're being video recorded, otherwise, I have a tendency to say some things I probably shouldn't say. I don't know that I'm going to give you an in-depth quiz. On okay. That. <laughs> I really just want to ask you a couple questions like, have okay. you seen it before? What is it? That sort of thing. All right, let's move forward. Although now that you've studied it, maybe we will do an in-depth quiz. I don't know. But anyway, have you had a sufficient opportunity uh, to review exhibit number 132 to tell me whether or not you're familiar with that training? Uh, I have. Okay, and are you familiar with that training? It does look familiar. Do you recall when the first time was that you received that training? I do not know that I received exactly this training. It looks mm -hmm. very similar, um, and that would be uh, in 2012. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and when you say it looks very similar, you mean it's the, s the similar subject matter? Correct. Not necessarily the same graphics, but the same information. Correct. It may not be this exact PowerPoint. Right. But you have, you, you do recall 
the first time that you were trained on this specific information was in 2012. That's my belief. Okay. So I would like you to turn then to the first dog-eared page in there. It's Bates marked or numbered CO12340 down in the right-hand corner. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. When I was talking to you earlier about the time it would take to get a warrant, that's the rule, right? Is that when we're gauging the immediacy of a danger, a severe, a danger of severe bodily injury to a child, that temporal element is driven by the time it takes to get a warrant, right? Correct. Okay. And we know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but from my notes, we know that at least as early as January 2010, there was no mechanism in place by which you could get a warrant, right? That's my understanding. Okay. And then if you turn over to CO12341, actually, I'm sorry, let's stay at 12340, where it says there it's the last bullet point or last hollow bullet point under exigent circumstances says primary consideration is there time to obtain a warrant first did i read that correctly yes what is meant by primary consideration insofar as you understand it as a admin manager level two over the er1 unit in relation to exigent circumstances whatever it is i mean what what do you teach your people this means where it's pr the primary consideration is their time to obtain a warrant what, what do you expect your people to take away from that i expect them to um, seek out and obtain a warrant if there's uh, time to do so if they feel that the child would be safe um, or that safety mechanisms could be in, put in place um, for the amount of time that it takes to receive a warrant Okay, and what does this mean to you here? This primary, the, the primary consideration is whether it's time to get a warrant. What does that mean? Primary consideration. As if they feel like the child would be placed in um, immediate risk or danger, physical, bodily harm, um, or in that amount of time. Doesn't primary consideration mean the most important consideration is whether or not there's time to get a warrant? Yes. Okay. And that's what you expect your subordinate social workers to do is consider first and foremost, is there time to get a warrant? Yes. So correct me if I'm wrong, but even if there is a danger of severe bodily injury, a substantial danger, if it's not immediate and there's time to get a warrant, they got to get a warrant. Correct. Okay. And secondarily, even if there is an immediate danger of severe bodily injury or even death to a child, and it's substantial, they still have to go that extra step to ascertain whether or not there are less intrusive means of protecting the child from that specific injury. Yes. Okay. So the warrant analysis isn't just do I need a warrant or not, it's whether or not there's some other way besides removing the child that we can protect the child from that specific injury. <clears throat> Correct. Okay. But we know that a social worker couldn't get a warrant at all before January 2010, right? Yes. We can, well, Yeah, I think probably skip one, two, three, four, one. <clears throat> Actually, let's look at one, two, three, four, one. And again, this is this is 
at least the substance of the information here. You may not have seen this graphic before, this particular layout. Slide. Slide. But the substance of what here, the first time you learned of it was in 2012, correct? Yes. Okay. And what it tells us here, first of all, the slide is titled, What Are Exigent Circumstances, right? Yes. Okay. And it tells us here that exigent circumstances exist where there is reasonable cause to believe that the child is in imminent danger of serious bodily injury, which would include sexual abuse. First, I read that sentence correctly. Yes. Okay. Then it goes on to define for us imminent danger means immediate risk. To show immediate risk, there must be reasonable cause to believe that the child is likely to experience serious bodily harm in the time that would be required to obtain a warrant. First, I read that correctly. Yes. Okay. And again, the first time you learned this was in 2012, correct? Correct. So, before 2012, I mean, you were an emergency response worker back in, uh, or supervisor, back in, was it 2004? Yes. How did you define immediate risk back then, when you couldn't even get a warrant? I'd uh, take it to consideration the facts of each individual case and situation and uh, whether or not we were able to provide um, protective interventions or safety interventions for the child to remain in the home. Well, and if it rose to the level where serious harm would come to the child. Serious harm or serious bodily injury or death? Because there's a difference, right? Objection argumentative. I think harm could, all, but serious bodily injury or death is also harm. It's also harm, but harm is kind of vague. How did you guys define it before you had specific exigency training? And I'm looking for a definition, not a process. How did you define the word? Harm would be a serious danger to the child, something that posed a serious uh, danger or risk to the child. I don't recall any specific no specific um, language language or definition that the agency used at the time right and I'll represent you I've been through all those policies the reason you don't recall it is because they didn't have a specific definition objection argumentative move to strike denied <laughs> um, let's move on to imminent imminent danger specific definition not a process how was imminency defined before January 2010? I, I don't recall. Well, was it defined as immediate risk? I don't recall what the, qualify, the qualifiers were. Did the definition include words to the effect of likely to experience serious bodily harm in the time that would be required to obtain a warrant, perhaps? I don't recall any language to that effect. Yeah. Actually, and the reason for that is because there was no process to get a warrant until 2010, right? Yes. Okay. And now, in, as part of the training today, well, let me ask you, maybe you don't know, maybe you haven't had it. Have you had the warrant training? You yourself, have you actually attended a formalized warrant training course or, or training course that had a warrant component where you saw the PowerPoint slides and somebody was lecturing and teaching what all that means? Yes. Okay, when did you yourself go through that training? It was, uh, I think we already established this back in 2012. Okay, 2012. Can I go back two questions We go have the question and answer reread? Yes. No, 
Now, as part of the training today, well, let me ask you, maybe you don't know, maybe you haven't had it. Have you had the warrant, you yourself, have you actually attended a formalized warrant training course or training course that had a warrant component where you saw the PowerPoint slides and somebody was lecturing and teaching what all that means? That's good enough, thank you. At least as of the last time you took the training, that in 2012, do you recall in learning the specific Ninths, or learning about, I guess, the specific Ninth Circuit cases that sort of outline these various warrant requirements we've been talking about today? I haven't had a training on Ninth Circuit. You have access Whatever. to Whatever, yeah, <laughs> yes. No, I um, maybe perhaps they were included in some of the trainings we had, but I don't recall. Okay. As a administrative manager, too, over in ER1, over at ER1, you have access to the policies on the intranet, the county's intranet, correct? Correct. And have you reviewed the warrant policy lately? Um, a few months ago, perhaps. Okay. Did you review the warrant policy at all in relation to putting together this declaration that you signed under penalty of perjury? No. Okay. And you didn't review the evolution of the current warrant policy either, correct? Correct. But you did review it, I think you said, a few months ago? I believe I did glance through it a few months ago. And okay. I'm going to show you what will mark as exhibit number 14 to your deposition. This one I do have an extra copy. So. You can just sort of thumb through that. I mean, I have a few questions, mainly at the beginning anyway, about whether or not you've seen that. Is that the policy that you reviewed way back two months ago or whatever, that sort of thing. to be the one that I reviewed. Okay. What was the reason you were reviewing it, if you remember? I uh, just been promoted to this position, so I was reviewing and uh, preparing all, you know, looking at all the policies that would affect my program. Okay, well, you weren't just promoted. I mean, you were promoted back in 2015, right? Um, to this position was in August 18th of 2017. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. What were you before that? How did I screw that up? What were you before August of 2017? I was administrative manager one in program integrity. Right. Okay. So you've only been an ER one administrative manager two since August. Yes. Okay. All right. So that makes sense then why you would have been reviewing this policy a couple months ago because you're, you're new to the job, right? Yes. Okay. So when you reviewed this policy a few months ago, what 
was it then that you first learned that, no, that doesn't work, that's 2012, forget it, scratch that. If I can get you to turn to page 17 of 20 of exhibit 14. When you reviewed this policy a couple months ago, this warrant policy a couple months ago, did you review the entire policy? I just flipped through it. Flipped through it. Did you read the legal mandates? I uh, don't recall if I did or not for this particular policy. Okay. Let me ask you, is emotional abuse, allegations of emotional abuse, is that a basis to remove a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? According to your experience and training? Depends. Really? Emotional abuse, what would it depend on? It would depend on a lot of different varying circumstances. Every case is very different. So well, I can't say never and I can't say always. Okay, let's try this again. The only allegation is emotional abuse. That's it, period, emotional abuse. Is there any set of circumstances under which emotional abuse would be a basis to remove a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? There may be. Okay. Have you ever heard of a case called Moodian versus County of Alameda? No. Okay. If I can get you to turn to page 19 of 20 of Exhibit 14. This is exhibit 14 I have, yes. Mm -hmm. Right in your policy, towards the center of the page, you see Moodian versus County of Alameda? I do. It's a 2002 case, right? Yes. Ninth Circuit, right? Yes. Okay, about five lines up from the bottom of that paragraph, you see the words, unlike physical harm? Yes. Unlike physical harm, such as a beating, which can have immediate and dire consequences, emotional harm by its nature does not carry the same immediacy. First, did I read that correctly? That's what the document says. That's what your policy says? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know whether or not, or do you recall actually, because you were there, whether or not back when you were an emergency response worker or supervisor, 2004 to 2007, do you know whether or not back then your workers were trained that it was appropriate to remove a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant where the allegations were just emotional abuse? 2004 to 2007, I was actually a social worker in emergency response. Oh, okay. Well, did you learn as a social worker in emergency response between 2004 and 2007 that emotional abuse would support the unwarranted, warrantless removal of a child from the custody of its parents? I don't recall any training as to that, no. Okay. But you know that children were removed from the custody of their parents based on emotional abuse correct? I don't know whether or not they have been. I thought I had another copy of this. I'm going to show you what will mark as exhibit number 123, your deposition. you first, now that you're an administrative manager to 
over an ER1 unit, are you, do you have access to the CWS CMS system? I do. And are you able to go in and actually check and see <coughs> what your workers are up to in terms of removing children and that sort of thing based on their CWS records? Because I'm not clear on what you're asking that I'm checking exactly. Do you ever track the work that your subordinate workers do? Um, I can track them by going and looking up cases as needed, but I don't routinely go in and review all their cases. You don't routinely. Do you have the ability to do that? Yes. Okay. And for example, you have the ability to go in and actually look year over year at, for example, how many children the particular worker may have removed. I don't know if I have that ability or not. I've never done that. Okay. Looking at exhibit number 123, the cover page, that's a letter from your attorneys. You see that? Yes. Okay, and they're saying there's a disk enclosed with the spreadsheet, right? Correct. And then a spreadsheet follows? Um, yes. And the spreadsheet's titled number, well, actually, Zach, this is bad on you probably. <laughs> it says number with mm -hmm. E of removal by staff in each calendar year. Sorry to call you out on that. I did not create this document. <laughs> okay. Anyway, somebody misspelled number, but that's fine. That doesn't matter for these purposes. Do you have any understanding that this spreadsheet represents the number of removals sorted by worker, by staff, for each calendar year ranging from 1995 to 2015? I haven't seen this document previously. Never seen it? No. Nobody's ever talked to you about the contents of it? No. Okay. So, do you know offhand how many children you yourself have removed from the custody of their parents during your, well, actually between 1995 and 2015? No. Can you give me an estimate? No. Okay. Let me see that real quick because I dog eared yours and okay. didn't mark mine. Um, these pages aren't numbered. I guess I should do that. Let's go off the record just for a second. We're off the record at 12.13. We're back on the record at 12.21. If I can get you to turn to page number 9 of Exhibit 123. Okay. And you see there in the left-hand column, I don't know, about a third of the way down from the top of the page, it says the year 2003. Correct. Yes, I do. Okay. What were you doing in 2003? What, what job were you working at? Do you remember? I believe I was in the Integrated Continuing Services. Okay. And let me ask you, I think that you had testified to this earlier, but as, as an Integrated Continuing Services worker, you did not receive training regarding the removal of children because that typically was not what you would be doing. Correct. Okay. If I can get you to go to page 10 of exhibit number 123. And this is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six rows down from the hole punch in the center of the page, you'll see a... I don't think we have hole punch. punches. Oh, you don't have hole punches? No. Okay, well. Eighteen rows up from the bottom. It's also, I think you highlighted it on her copy, too. Oh, did I? She has, oh, okay, yeah. Right. So. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for that. That would have been easier. Yeah, that would have been easier. You see there the highlight on page 10 of your name? <laughs> I'm just counting. I'm like, is it the right line? Same line. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me start over. Do you see there the highlight of your name on page 10 of exhibit 123? 
Okay, and it says there that you removed one child, right? It does. That was in 2003, correct? Uh, according to this document, yes, that's correct. Okay. And we know that in 2003, there was no warrant process in place, correct? Yes. So there was no procedure, no forms, nothing you could file with the juvenile court to obtain an order authorizing the removal of a child, right? Yes. And we also know that at that point in time, in 2003, when you were working in integrated continuing services, ICS? Yes. We know that your job duties did not typically include removing children, right? Yes. So you didn't have any training regarding the circumstances under which it was legally permissible to remove children, right? No. No, I'm... No, it's not. That's not a correct statement. Okay. Okay. So, back then, what specific circumstances was it permissible to remove under what specific... Scratch it. Back then, 2003, according to your understanding back then, what specific circumstances were required in order for you to remove a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? Well, we didn't have a warrant process then. Didn't. Okay. Did not. Thank you. Okay, so you couldn't get a warrant. Correct. Okay, so what were the specific circumstances that you were required to meet before you could remove a child from the custody of its parents without getting a warrant? I had to believe that the child was in uh, immediate risk or danger. Um, we had to uh, make sure that there were any other um, ways to keep the child safe before removing them from a parent. And uh, there had to be consultation and agreement by your supervisor. Okay, and I think we covered this a little bit earlier that when we're talking about the immediate risk of harm or danger to the child, there was no specific definition for that, correct? Uh, to my knowledge or recollection, at this, as I'm sitting here today, no. No, I'm not correct? No, or? you are correct. There was no okay. definition. Okay, but now we know that the definition is immediate risk of severe bodily injury or death, right? Yes. Okay. Back then, you didn't have that definition, right? Correct. So it could have been a lesser danger than severe bodily injury or death. You weren't looking to see if the kid was going to die before you'd remove him, right? Correct. And you weren't in looking some to... some circumstances. Well, in most circumstances, mm -hmm. right? Well, there had to be some sort of... Um, severe enough risk to remove the child from the parent. Like emotional abuse, for example. Depends for any of the any of the white codes, really. So you could remove without a warrant back then, if I'm understanding you right, for general neglect. Yes. Okay. How's general neglect general neglect defined? Um, is uh, maltreatment of a child or that the child's um, safety is put at risk or the ch child's place placed in harm or danger in relation um, to uh, neglect by the parent. Well, social workers, we determine as neglect. Well, there's a difference, isn't there, between neglect, general neglect, and severe neglect. They're all defined by the penal code, right? Yes. And there's a difference between the three, right? Yes. Okay. What's the difference? Uh, well, According to your training and understanding. Well, the neglect category, um, general neglect is um, part of the penal code, but then underneath it there's the two subdivisions of uh, regular neglect and severe neglect. Okay, but you just told me that you understand there's a difference between general neglect neglect and severe neglect. By definition, there's a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. What is that difference? Well, severe neglect is it to cause um, severe harm to a child. Okay. Um, and regular neglect could be just uh, like a failure to protect and by the parent. Okay. And what about general neglect? How is that defined? I believe that encompasses, um, again, the failure to protect and um, 
we, we kind of keep, it includes both of them. Okay. Severe and general, severe and failure to protect. Now severe neglect, that could include situations where due to the neglect, the child is likely to suffer severe bodily injury or death, right? Yes. And even under neglect, there are circumstances where the neglect by the parent could lead to the child suffering severe bodily injury or death, right? Correct. What about under general neglect as defined by the penal code? I think it was, no, I don't recall at this moment. Aren't I correct that according to the penal code definition, general neglect is only present where there is no risk of bodily injury. Section to extent it calls for a legal conclusion. Based on your training and experience, which according to your declaration seems pretty vast. I believe it's, if I am recalling it correctly, it's uh, harm or potential harm. For general neglect? Really? That's my recollection, yes. Okay, well let's see if we can help you out on that a little bit. I didn't remember that I'd split these up. Here's a copy for you. I actually did bring a copy. Uh oh. Hmm. Okay, here we go. I am going to show you what we will mark as exhibit number 122 to your deposition. <clears throat> And let me ask you first, you recognize that document as being an official policy document of the County of Orange? Just see the first page there where it says, uh, Orange County Social Services Agency CFS Operations Manual? Yes. I read that correctly? Yes. What is the Orange County Social Services Agency CFS Operation Manual? It's um, the Operations Manual for the Policies and Procedures. Okay. For Children and Family Services. Okay, and, and this one in particular, Abuse Investigations Practice Guidelines. Have you reviewed this policy before? Yes. Okay, and what is this, Abuse Investigations Practice Guidelines? What's your understanding of the intention of this policy? It provides a guideline for our social workers, um, uh, practice guideline for our social workers who investigate child abuse referrals. Okay. So this is something that your workers are required to adhere to in the conduct of their child abuse investigations? Yes. And let me ask you one more time before we get into the document. Does general neglect include um, conduct that leads to the injury, physical injury of a child? It could. It could. Okay, if I can get you to turn to page zero, <clears throat> 01903, internal page number two of 25, top of the page it says definitions. You see that? Yes. What are these? Uh, definitions of uh, California Penal Code sections in relation to child abuse and neglect. Do you have any understanding of why these are in here in this policy? Uh, provides um, the legal guidelines for social workers as to what each um, al allegation, if you will, but um, definitions. 
Okay, it's actually the definitions of the various types of conduct that your agency is responsible for investigating, right? Correct. And each specific type of conduct has a specific name and definition, right? Each type of, uh, like, allegation or? Yeah. Con yes. Yeah, for example, child abuse is defined by the penal code. Yes. Penal code section 11165.6. Correct. Physical abuse is also defined by the penal code, right? Yes. Sections 11165.4 and 11165.6, correct? <clears throat> I'm sorry, could you repeat that last one? I'm not sure yes. the penal codes are correct. Sure. Physical abuse is also defined by the penal code, correct? Yes. That would be penal code sections 11165.4 and 11165.6, correct? That's correct. Okay. What did I say before? I think you may have had sexual abuse with the penal, with the physical abuse. Oh, no, abuse. I was going to get to that one. <laughs> sexual abuse, that's defined specifically by the penal code, right? Yes. And that's 11165.1, correct? Correct. Then emotional abuse, that's defined specifically by the penal code, right? Yes. It's 11166.05, right? Yes. Neglect, that is specifically and independently on its own defined by the penal code, right? Yes. And that's penal code section 11165.2, correct? Yes. Severe neglect, if you turn to page 3 of 25, that is itself specifically and independently defined by the penal code, correct? Yes. And it's defined in penal code section 11165.2, subparagraph A. Is that right? Yes. General neglect, that is also on its own independently defined by the penal code, right? Yes. Okay, and that's Penal Code Section 11165.2, subparagraph B. Yes. Let's read it together. Okay. The negligent failure, and this is general neglect, is the negligent failure of a person having the care or custody of a child to provide adequate food, clothing, shelter, medical care, or supervision where no physical injury to the child has occurred. Did I read that correctly? You did. Am I correct that general neglect, as it is defined under law, specifically excludes physical injury to the child? Objection calls for a legal conclusion interpretation of the statute. Well, let's address the objection. As a, and you told me a little bit about this earlier, we can go into it again. As an administrative manager two over ER1, part of your job duties include ensuring that your subordinate workers adhere to the policies of the County of Orange, correct? Yes. And it also includes ensuring that your subordinate workers understand the law that applies to the work they do, correct? Yes. And that they adhere to the law that applies to the work that they do, correct? Yes. And as part of your ability to execute that requirement of your job, am I correct that you at least have to have a rudimentary understanding of the law that applies to the work that you and your subordinate workers do? Yes. Okay, so can I have before the objection, the last question reread, please? Am I correct that general neglect, as it is defined under law, specifically excludes physical injury to the child? Yes. Okay. And in fact, where there are allegations against a parent of general neglect, that that may not be reported, cannot be reported, to the CACI index. It's specifically excluded from the types of abuse that are required to be reported to the CACI index. Yes, okay. that's correct. 
And the reason it is excluded from the types of abuse that are required to be reported to the CACI index is because there is no physical injury to the child. I don't know. Okay. What is your understanding of the reasoning behind excluding substantiated findings of general neglect from inclusion in the CACI index? I don't know why it's not included. But you know it's not. But I know it's not. Okay. And you know that where there's allegations of general neglect, there's no physical injury to the child, by definition. Yes. Okay. Have you ever yourself removed a child from the custody of its parents based on general neglect? I don't recall specifically. How about generally? Do you generally recall ever removing a child from the custody of its parents on the basis of general neglect? I'm sure I have. You're sure you have? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times? No. Do you know how many kids you've removed over the course of your career? I may have asked you that earlier. I don't remember. I do not recall. Does 12 sound about right? I don't know. When's the last time that you removed a child from the custody of its parents? I don't know. When's the last time? Well, let me ask you this. In your position, when you were a supervisor of emergency response workers, I'm correct, aren't I, that in order to remove a child from the custody of its parents, the line worker, the emergency response worker out in the field, has to first obtain supervisor approval to do that? Yes. Okay. Did you ever, while you were an emergency response supervisor, I think that was between 2012 and 2014, right? 2012 and 2014. Okay. Did you ever yourself approve the removal of a child from the custody of its parents? I'm sure I did. Okay. Do you know how many times? No. 2012 to 2014. If you can do me a favor and go back to that big bat exhibit, exhibit number 123, and turn to page. Hold on. I need to find the year. Turn to page 36. Towards the middle of the page there, you see the year 2012? Yes. Can you do me a favor and go through from page 36 to in a second here. 36 through 49 and place a star next to each of the names who were your subordinate workers during that time period. And if we can take a break, I need to go to the bathroom and get the coffee. We are off record at 1241. We are back on the record at 104. Okay, on the break, I had asked you to go through Exhibit 123, the entries covering the time period from 2012 through and including 2014. And I'm correct that that was the time period in which you were a supervisor in the ER unit? Yes. Okay. And what I had asked you to do was go through and mark for me um, the particular social workers, the names of the social workers who you supervised during that time period. Were you able to do that for me? Uh, I did go through the list, yes. Okay. And it looks 
I think, where's your first mark? I think it was on page 30, 38. 38. And who did you mark? Thomas Malabon. About how far down is he? Uh, about halfway down. Found him. Cool. And he had five removals in 2012? Correct. Okay. Who is the next person that you, or on what page does the next person that you marked appear? Uh, also page 38. Okay. Who? Leticia Zalva. She's fourth from the bottom. And she's got one removal? Yes. The next person that you marked, where do they appear? Uh, page 39. Uh, one, two, three, four. Fifth from the top, Isaac Alpinar. Got it. And he's got three removals? Yes. Okay, the next one? Uh, Gary King, about halfway down. King, King, got him. He's got six removals? Yes. Okay. And the next one? Uh, no more on page 39, none on page 40, none on page 41, page 42, Thomas Malabon again. Oops. He's about a third down. Got him. He's got three removals there, right? Yes. Okay. Next uh, one. Isaac Alpinar is also on page 42, nice. about two thirds of the way down. What was his name? Applemar, got it. Yes. And he has nine removals reflected there, right? Yes. Any more on that page? No. Okay, where does the next one appear? Page 43, top of the page, Gary King. And he has two removals? Yes. Okay, any more on that page? No. Okay, where's the next one? Uh, page 44. Okay. Third from the top, Isaac Alpinar. And he's got 17 removals there, right? Yes. Okay. So many people that was. Okay. Any more on that page? Uh, yes, Heather Luna. She's couple down from Isaac. Oh, got it. And she has three removals? Yes. Okay. Any more on that page? No. Okay. And the next place where you have over uh, page response. 45, Heather Luna, she's third from the top. Got it. Two oh. removals? Yeah, that's the only one I spotted there on page 45. Okay. <clears throat> page 46, Thomas Malabon. Seems There's like he was with you for a while. And he's about uh, a little less than halfway down with two removals, is that yes. right? Okay. Any more on page 46? Uh, Leticia Zalva. She's about two-thirds down. Got it. And she's got two removals reflected there, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> page 47. 47. Okay. Uh, Gary King, third from the top. Got him. He's got two removals? Yes. Okay. And Isaac Alpinar, uh, he is fourth from the bottom. On page 47. With seven removals. Yes. Any on 48? Uh, Heather Luna, top of the page. Uh, I see her. I'm starting to recognize these names. She has four removals? Yes. And anybody else there that's your subordinate or that, that was your subordinate? Um, I didn't notice any. I do see a name. It might be a made a name of one of my workers, I'm not sure. Which one is it? Leticia Jimenez. She's uh, like fifth the from bottom. the bottom. Yeah, I see her with one removal. Yes. But you're not sure about her? Not positive. Okay. And then what about on page 49? Um, I have one entry, Heather Luna, third from the top. And she's got three removals. Yes. Okay. Now, 2013 through, or 2012 through 2014, wasn't that long ago, so you might have a memory. If you don't, just let me know. All these people that we've gone through with their varying removals, first am I correct 
I think I am, that in order for them to have removed a child from the custody of its parent, either with or without a warrant, they had to get your approval. Not my approval necessarily. Well, their supervisor's approval. A supervisor's approval. So any supervisor. Correct. Do you recall ever giving yourself, ever giving approval to any of the people you've identified to remove these children? I don't recall a specific incident. How about generally? Do you have a general recollection of giving approval to one of these identified people to remove a child? I'm sure I did. Okay. Why are you sure you did? Uh, because they were in my unit, I regularly consulted with them, and it wouldn't be rare for them to consult with me on a case or to ask for approval if okay. uh, the situation warranted. Okay, but you don't specifically remember any specific of that? Specific cases or anything? No. Or okay. numbers? No. What about specific circumstances? No. Okay. I don't recall. Okay. <clears throat> what about, are you able to differentiate, do you recall ever instructing one of these people during that 2012 to 2014 time period, no, don't remove the kid, go get a warrant? I don't recall providing that instruction. Ever? During that period of 2012 right. to 2014. Um, I don't recall any specific incident. Do you think you may have and you're not, just not remembering, or do you think that you don't recall because it didn't happen? No, I think it happened and, you know, to get a warrant. Mm -hmm. You just don't have any specific recollection. Correct. And you don't have any specific recollection of the specific scenarios that you dealt with in giving those instructions, either get a warrant or seize the kid without a warrant. Correct. What about now, in the capacity that you serve now as a program manager two over ER1? Do you ever get involved in the decision about whether to seize a child with or without a warrant? Yes. Okay. How frequently does that happen? It's hard to say. You know, every week is a little bit different. Uh, yesterday, I had a lot of consultations. Other weeks, I've had none. Okay. Now, since it's fairly current, you've only been in that position since August. Do you have a specific recollection of some of the scenarios you were presented with when you were called in to help with the decision about whether to get a warrant or remove without a warrant? Um, yes. Okay, can you give me some of those scenarios? Objection to relevance. Go ahead. Um, we did have a case that's in my declaration. I believe it's number 10 in example 20, the 23 paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, the mother was uh, hallucinating and having some delusions. She was seeing uh, bugs and uh, hearing voices and felt that uh, in both on her body and her child's, her infant baby's body. And the hospital uh, was not going to keep her. They would be released <coughs> mm -hmm. out into the community to care for an infant. And uh, we did not feel it was safe for her to provide care for the baby. So did you place a hospital hold or did you actually physically no. go out and remove the child after she left the hospital? Um, it was done, I believe, after she left when she was at the hospital still, but it wasn't a hospital hold because they were not admitted to the hospital. Okay, I gotcha. So she was at the hospital. In the emergency room. Okay, and the emergency room called you guys, said, hey, this was going on, and then you guys actually came out to the emergency room and detained the child? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> 
any other specific scenarios that you recall? Well, let me ask you this first. This number 10, the mom hallucinating, that happened sometime, obviously, after August of this year, right? Yes. Okay. Any others that you have a specific, any other scenarios that you have a specific recollection of that happened since you've become the admin manager too? Where that happened, where? Where you were called in to help make the decision whether to seize a child or not without getting a warrant. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, there's number 11 in my declaration, mm -hmm. and section 23. And what was that scenario? Uh, the baby, the mother had driven in from Las Vegas with the baby in the middle of the night. They checked into a motel room, uh, from my understanding, very early in the morning, like four or five in the morning. Uh, shortly after, or um, early that morning, mother called uh, 911 and had to ask that the baby um, be transported to the hospital. Mother said baby had stepped on a uh, needle full of heroin. I remember that when I read that. And um, she went to the hospital with the baby uh, when the hospital informed <coughs> her that she would be um, needing to have the baby screened for the drugs and that the police were gonna be called. She took the baby and fled the hospital against medical advice. Okay. Actually, I don't, I'm not sure they even had opportunity to you know, advise her. She just took the baby and left. Okay, so how did you guys find her? A uh, social worker went back to the motel mm -hmm. and um, with, they were looking for her and they consulted on me as whether or not I would provide excellency for their removal. Um, she was waiting for the police and she, wasn't, she was concerned that the police would not arrive in time. And what do you mean when you say she was wondering whether you would provide exigency for the removal? What does that mean? And she didn't think that the baby had enough um, time to get to get a warrant, um, given the circumstances of the baby's health was at risk. Uh, we had thought potentially she had had a dose of heroin uh, that she needed immediate medical attention for. Okay. He or she, I don't recall, was a male or female child. When, when the hospital... Uh, called you, did they indicate whether or not they had treated the child? I don't uh, recall that that, that was a okay. mentioned. But the concern there on the part of the social worker, if I'm understanding you correctly, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, was that the child might be in need of immediate medical care. The, what was communicated to me is that the mm -hmm. child needed to get back to the hospital. Okay. And the mom was not cooperating. Uh, correct. I think they were still looking for the mom and child at that point. Okay. Well, I think you'd said the social worker had found them at the motel, but and was waiting for the for police. The police. But the pol she was worried the police wouldn't get there in time. Correct. Okay. So once you I gave her the permit, and you 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 approved the seizure of the child, right? Um. I, uh, this is before she was looking for the child, uh -huh. um, and she said, if I find the child before and the police aren't here or they don't respond, um, then do I have permission? Okay, so the permission was given in advance of actually finding the mother. Correct. I gotcha. I understand. Any other specific scenarios that you recall that occurred uh, since now you've become the administrative manager level two? I don't recall any other specific ones. Okay. Um, let me find that. Where did I mark your declaration? Going back for a moment to exhibit number A, that's your declaration. <clears throat> I want to make sure I, I'm understanding this correctly. The the two scenarios that you were personally involved in that you have a recollection of were number 10 and number 11 that appear at page 7, lines 6 through 12 of your declaration. That's Exhibit A. Did I get that right? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. If we go up to the beginning of paragraph 23, go to item number two, the scenario number two, two-year-old child found running in the street unsupervised. You see that one? Yes. Okay. Was that a case that you were involved in? No. You remember a case, uh, Million Cole versus County of Orange and then a whole bunch of other people? Yes. Okay, you were actually sued in that case, right? Yes, I was. That was a warrantless seizure case, right? Uh, yes. And the County of Orange paid out about $475,000 to settle that case, right? Yes. Okay. And that case stemmed from a younger child who had been found running in the street unsupervised, right? That child was detained. You remember that? I believe that's true. Okay. And then what happened? That child was detained without a warrant, and then the other three children were also later detained as a sibling ad without a warrant, right? Can you repeat that? You know what a sibling ad is, don't you? Or ad sibling, however you guys say it. Like a newborn well, uh, to dependent children? Or a circumstance where one sibling has been detained, the others have not yet been detained, but you're going to detain them. You do an ad sibling petition, right? It's like a 300J or something. Yes. Okay, so you know what that is. Yes. Okay. Am I correct that in the Milligan Cole case that First, the initial child, the two-year-old that was wandering the streets, was seized without a warrant, right? That's my recollection. And then the siblings, his siblings, were later seized without a warrant on the basis of general neglect with an ad sibling allegation, 300J. You remember that? I don't recall that. Okay. I don't have that particular document because that would be 27 protected and I couldn't get it in this short of notice and time, but somewhere, let's see if I can find what I'm looking for. That's not what I want. This one. Okay, I'll show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 83.1. Exhibit number 83.1 is titled Settlement Agreement Mutual Release. You see that? Yes. And you're listed right in there. It says this settlement agreement mutual release is made by and between plaintiffs Paul Milligan, Sarah Cole, and SD, a minor, MM, a minor, and BM, a minor, by and through their guardian ad litem, Danny Truitt, and defendant Colleen Haunch. You see that? Yes. So you were the only defendant that settled in this case. Am I getting that right? I don't believe so. Well, there's no other defendant listed there, is there? On that particular portion that you read, no, there's not. Well, let's see. Maybe it was an error on their part. Down under recitals, it looks like they list some other defendants. But in the settlement and release, you're the only one listed. Is that right? Uh, in the settlement release, yes. I don't know what the other parties were okay. subject to or not. Okay. And what their agreements were, or if they had agreements, I don't know. I don't know. Sure, I understand. And if you go to let me 
make sure I got the amounts right. Oh, it looks like James Waldron was added by uh, added as a substitute for a dough. Is there a question somewhere? Yeah, I'm looking for the amount on this thing. Is this like I this is a waiver of cost settlement? Is this the wrong one? Settlement terms on page five. Yeah. Plaintiffs shall file separate dismissals for defendant. Uh, where is that? Defendants agree to waive costs and attorney's fees. Yeah, they gave me the wrong one. I don't see the other one that has the amount. So that's it. Okay. Well, that's the only one I've got with me. Um, I have one somewhere where it broke out the attorney's fees and all that stuff. That's probably with regarding the remaining defendants. Yeah, it's probably other defendants. Right. So anyway, we know you settled for a waiver of costs, but I think you told me this earlier that that case in total with the county did settle for $475,000, correct? Uh, I believe... You refresh my memory on that, and that sounds about right. Okay. And I think we've refreshed your memory even more now that you got out of it completely, right? Got out of it? The lawsuit. Um, Look, it looks like by this settlement agreement, you got out with a waiver of costs. Yes. Okay. Back then, let's see when this thing happened. I think you were... Do you, do you remember if you were an ER supervisor or continuing services at that point in time? Uh, at that point in time, I worked in specialized family services, continuing court services. Okay, so that it looks like here in reviewing the complaint, that's Exhibit 83, it looks like that was in 2008 then, right? Uh, when the removal Yeah, when occurred. the removal when the removal happened. I believe that's the incident. Yes, that, that's a, the time frame for the incident that occurred. Okay. And do, so you would have been continuing, I think you said special services, that would have been the medical, right? Specialized family services, yes, medical right. unit. And in part that was because these children had um, special medical needs in addition to whatever was going on under their home. Uh, I need to review the children that you had listed here. One of the children in this family did have special medical needs. Okay. And that would have been why... I don't know if he's listed here or not. Okay. And that would have been why your unit was involved with that family? Yes. Okay. Were you involved in the, in any way, in the detention, the original seizure of these, any of these children? No. Okay. That would explain probably why you got out. Do you have any understanding as to why it was that the County of Orange was willing to settle that case for $475,000? Jackson calls for speculation from this witness. If you know. I don't have specific reasoning. Specific reasoning. What about general? Do you have a general understanding as to why it was the County of Orange was willing to pay $475,000 to settle this warrantless seizure case? Objection calls for speculation. No, I guess not. Okay. Have you ever talked to anybody about that other than your attorneys here? Um. My attorney at the time, probably, maybe. Don't have to tell me anything about your conversations okay. with, I think it was Dan Spradlin, right? Correct. Yeah, you, that's attorney-client privilege. I'm not entitled to it. Other than Mr. Spradlin, um, have you talked to anybody at all about why it was the County of Orange was willing to pay $475,000 for the warrantless removal of these kids? No. Okay. And that, you, you agree with me, that was all back in 2008. Right? 
when the incident occurred, apparently it was 2008. Yeah. Yes, I, as I said, I was not a party to that. Okay. But the seizure happened in 2008? That's my recollection from reading the court reports at the time. Okay. And back then, I think we've already talked a little bit about this, but back then there was no specific definition regarding what was meant by exigent circumstances, right? In 2008, there was no specific definition, correct. Right. Okay, this item number one, you, you told me earlier that you didn't have a recollection of any of the specific scenarios that you were involved in prior to the very recent scenarios in 2017, right? Correct. Are you talking about uh, paragraph 23 of my declaration? Well, well, not yet. Okay. Can I have my question reread, please? This item number one, you told me earlier that you didn't have a recollection of any of the specific scenarios that were involved in prior to the very recent scenarios in 2017, right? That you were involved in. Not right about that? You don't have a specific recollection of any of the things that, any of the child seizures that you were involved in prior to your current position in 2017? Correct. Okay, so this item number one under paragraph 23, where'd you get that information? Um, it was provided to me by um, individuals in my um, agency who have knowledge of the case. Who? Uh, the social worker who uh, worked on the case. Name? Lisa Powers. When did this case happen? 2016. So that would have been after the time period when we got all this training specifically defining exigent circumstances, right? Correct. Okay. What about uh, item number, we already talked about item number two. What about item number three? Is there a question? Yeah, six-year-old child whose mother and father kept drugs in the home. How'd you find out about that? It's not your case, right? Correct. Um, I found out that again um, from uh, people knowing of the case in my agency and I also spoke with the social worker involved. Okay. People knowing of the case, people mm -hmm. sounds plural to me, right? Well, a person, I guess. Okay. And you spoke, in addition to that person, you spoke with the social worker. Yes, it was information provided by my agency and the social worker. Okay. Agency again. You know, an agency doesn't have any corporeal presence. It operates through people, right? Correct. So I need a name. Uh, it was the example was provided to me by Elon Wolf. I'm sorry? Elon Wolf. Was that the social worker or the agency representative? He's the agency representative. Okay, and who was the social worker? Kim Schneider. Was that also a 2016 case? No, that was, I believe it was a 2010 case. Do you remember when in 2010? No, when I asked her that she told me she believed she, it was in 2010. Uh, she didn't know for sure? No. And she didn't go check to verify in the CWS system what year that happened? I don't know if she did or not. You didn't ask her to? Uh, I asked her for her recollection for the time frame, okay. and she told me it was 2010. Okay, and what about for the specific facts and circumstances? Was, this, was that also just from her recollection, or did she actually go look at the case file? If you know. I don't know. You didn't ask her to verify the information by actually looking at documents from the case? No. Didn't ask her to get on the CWS CMS system and see what happened there? No. Get the specific facts and the scenario? No. Okay, you just took her word for it? Yes. Okay. Um, item number four, children living in a home with mother and other. Now this one's, in, okay, this is different. This is not the kid that stepped on the syringe. Correct. The children living in a home with mother and other residents in which the following were found that it lists heroin, syringes, all kinds of stuff. Where'd that information come from? Uh, again, from um, 
information was provided by the agency representative. Who? As well, excuse me? Who? Elon Wolf. As well as I did speak um, with a social worker about that as well. Her name is uh, Kimberly Schneider. Same social worker? Same social worker. Okay. And what about this one that we talked about a little bit earlier with uh, Lisa Powers? Who was the agency representative you spoke to on that one? Uh, Elon Wolf. Did you ask Mr. Wolf how it was that he was coming up with these various scenarios? Uh, he, I don't recall if I asked him. So clearly at some point you had a conversation with the guy, right? Yes. When was that conversation? In the last few weeks. Okay, so within two or three weeks. A couple weeks, weeks yeah. Okay. Where did that conversation take place? Uh, it was a telephone conversation. Did you call him or did he call you? I don't recall. Okay. How long was that telephone conversation? I don't recall. Okay. Did you take notes of that telephone conversation? I don't believe so, no. Okay. What did he tell you? Uh, he had told me that there were some examples um, th that we could be provided as when accident circumstances were granted and children removed um, or accident circumstances granted for removal. I'm sorry, say that again. What, what did he tell you in this conversation? that he could help provide some examples of um, agencies when, where the agency had approved accident circumstances for removal. Okay, so, so the, sam the, the example scenarios he was giving you were scenarios where the agency had determined that an exigent circumstance existed and approved the line worker's removal of the particular child? Yes. Okay. And you didn't take any notes of that? No. Where did you get the information regarding which particular social workers to call to verify? Uh, it was provided by another agency person. Who? Uh, her name is Tracy Otani. Tracy, spell it please. Uh, not clear I can. Uh, I think it's O T A N I. It's probably close enough. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. Um, did that happen by telephone? Uh, she came. No. She came to your office. She came to my office. Tell me everything you recall about that interaction. Um, I asked her to review uh, these examples with me. I um, said I would like to have the name of the social worker. So I may call that social worker myself. Okay, obviously that conversation happened after your conversation with Elon Wolf, right? Yes. How long after? I don't recall. Weeks? It, yeah, no, it wasn't that long. It was Day or a two? couple days, yeah. Okay. And you didn't take any notes of your conversation with Elon Wolf. Did I, did I get that right? Correct. Okay. Tracy Otani didn't come to see you until a couple days after your conversation with Elon Wolf, right? Yes. You got nine scenarios here that you were not personally involved in, right? Correct. And you were able to just remember all of those for two days until you met with Tracy Otani without reference to notes? Uh, when I met with Tracy Otani, no, I didn't have notes. And you were able to remember all these nine scenarios? Yes. That's pretty good. But you can't remember the a couple of days. specific experiences that you had back in 2007? Correct. 
you can't even remember the general experiences you had seizing children back in 2000, whenever it was, seven? Correct. And then did you personally speak with Lisa Powers? I did. Okay. Was that telephone or in person? In person. Did she go to you or come to you or did you go to her? Uh, actually, we met in the parking lot. Okay. Did she have any papers with her? No. How long was that conversation? About five minutes, a five, couple of minutes. And you didn't do anything. You didn't uh, go into the CWS system to review any documents or anything to verify that what she was telling you was correct? No. And no, I'm not correct, or no, you didn't do that? No, I did not. Okay. What about uh, Kim Schneider? Did you meet with her in person to verify that what Elon was telling you was correct? No. Did you speak with her on the phone to verify what Elon was telling you was correct? I did. Okay. When? Uh, Friday... Last Friday, I believe it was last Friday. How long was that conversation? Uh, perhaps over five minutes, under 10 minutes. Okay. And is that because she had more than one scenario to give you? Yes. Okay. And again, I'm correct that you did not yourself go into the documents of the case or the CWS CMS system to re do your own research to verify that what she was telling you was correct? Correct. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about item number four. What about item number five? Child left in a hot car with dangerously high temperatures at the Brea Mall and parent could not be located. You see that one? Yes. I think it's lines uh, 19 through 21, right? Yes. Whose was that? Uh, I don't know who that one belonged to. Okay, but was, was it one Elon Wolf told you about? Yes. Did he tell you when that happened? Uh, no. Okay, did you do anything? Go into the CWS system, look at the case file, get the case name, anything to verify that what he was telling you was correct? No. Did you do anything to pin down a time frame when this might have happened? Uh, I asked Elon what time frame it occurred in. And what did he tell you? He was not able to provide me a timeline. Okay. Did you ask him, well, you know, where are you getting this information then? Yes. And what did he tell you? He said that he couldn't recall. That he had, he had, uh, did have the documentation, but he didn't recall and he couldn't find it at the moment. And you didn't follow up with him to see if he could find it and give you more detailed information? I did. And did he ultimately find it and give you more detailed information? No. Why not? I don't know. Okay. Did you ask him? Say, dude, come on, man. I'm doing this declaration. I need more detailed information. I, like I said, he didn't have the information for me. Okay. And you didn't do anything yourself to locate information that could verify or pin down when this happened? No. Okay. And that's not one where you were able to call the actual worker. That's something you got from Mr. Wolf? Yes. What is Mr. Wolf's position there anyway? Uh, he is a litigation coordinator for the quality support team litigation. in the administration division of Orange County Social Services. Litigation coordinator. Do you have any understanding what that is? I believe that's his title. Yeah, but do you have any understanding of what that is? What what he's supposed to be doing? Calls for speculation. Only if you know, or you have an understanding. Somebody's explained it to you. My understanding is that he um, provides is a liaison or helps provides advice assistance to social workers and attorneys involved in litigation. The county's attorneys, right? Yes. Okay, so like. Zach and Bill. Yes. I guess I should say Mr. Schwartz and Mr. Howell, since we are on the record. Right. Thank you, Sean. I'm sorry. I told you, that's one of the problems with being all informal, is you start to forget. It's a little too comfortable. Okay, looking at item number six here, it's at uh, lines 21 through 23, uh, page six, exhibit A. Four and a half year old child living with mother 
and sober living home who had recent history of grabbing knife and threatening to kill herself locked herself in bathroom while child watched pornographic videos. I presume Mr. Wolf told you about that one? Yes. Did he give you a time frame? Uh, 1998. So that was long before there was any ability to even get a warrant, right? Correct. Okay. About 12 years. Yes. Or more. Or more, yeah. Did he give you the name of the particular worker? Yes. Who was that? Christine Smith. That sounds familiar to me for some reason. I'll have to look that one up. Did you talk to Ms. Smith? I did. And what'd she have to say? Uh, she said that, yes, that was an incident where she brought this child into custody without a warrant. Okay. How long after the mother had grabbed a knife and locked herself in the bathroom, how long after that event was it before the child was seized? I don't know. How long was it from the time that the referral came into the agency to the point that Ms. Smith actually made it out into the field to investigate? I don't know. In your training, did you ever learn that past threat of injury does not support a current finding of immediate danger? Yes. Okay, when did you first learn that? I don't recall when I first learned that. Okay, was it sometime after 2012? Probably before. How about 2007? Probably before. When is the first time that you were an emergency response worker? That would have been, uh, was that 2004? Or did I write that down wrong? 2004. Okay. Did you learn that in 2004? Um, yes, I'm sure I knew it then. I don't know exactly when I learned that during my training. So you'd agree with me, wouldn't you, that any time we're going out to investigate a referral, any alleged past injury to the child is not sufficient to support a current finding of exigent circumstances, right? We have to look at the present situation to determine whether there's an immediate danger of severe bodily injury to the child. Is that correct? Yes. So past allegations or allegations of past injuries or threats of injury do not form an exigent circumstance. Define your timeline for past. Two days, three days. And I'd say yes. Okay. Yes, it does not form the basis for exigency, right? Correct. Okay. So going back to this incident number one, an infant, an infant who is nearly suffocated by its mother under the influence of an unknown substance. How long was it between the time that referral came in and the time it was investigated? I don't know. And where was the child detained from? Was it the hospital, the home, the school, daycare? If I recall my conversation, the social worker said it was at the mother's home. At the mother's home. How many days after the uh, alleged event was it before the child was seized? The alleged re event in the child abuse uh, report? Well, I mean, the alleged event here is that the child was nearly, was actually not suffocated, but was nearly suffocated by its mother who was under the influence, allegedly, of an unknown substance, right? Yes. So how long was that? How long from the point of reporting to the point of seizure? How long was it? How many hours? How many days? My understanding with the social worker is that it, from my conversation with Lisa Powers, mm -hmm. is that it was um, before she left the home. What do you mean before she, she left? She was the in home? the home and witnessed the event. Oh, she was there and saw it? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, if you read the whole sentence, it kind of explains it at the end. Okay. Was there anybody else in the home? A dad, maybe? I don't know. An aunt, an uncle? I don't know. On the two-year-old child found running unsupervised in the street, we've already sort of talked about that a little bit. How long was it between the time that the referral came in and the time that the social worker actually went out to investigate? I don't know. Okay. How long was it between the time that the social worker actually arrived on the scene and began her, or began her investigation and the time she, she seized the child? I don't know. And what about with respect to the siblings? How long was it between the time that there was a referral received on the siblings and the time that the social worker seized the children without a warrant? What siblings? The two-year-old siblings, the Milligan Cold case. Oh, I um, don't believe, I don't know if this is related to the Milligan Cold case or not. Okay, just coincidence. That there was a two-year-old weren't found running in the street? Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same case or not. Okay. But you don't know the answer to any of those time-related questions either, right? Uh, actually, from what the social worker told me, the two-year-old child found running in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe she told me that happened in 2010. So I don't believe well, that would be the Cole Milligan case. Okay. I think it was the six-year-old that was 2010, right? Yes, the six-year-old was also 2010. Okay. So you're saying the two-year-old was also 2010? That was uh, what was explained to me, yes. Okay, and who was the worker that explained that to it you? It was uh, Kimberly uh, Schneider. So Ms. Schneider actually had three cases that she gave you. Uh, yes, I think another one of hers might be here as well. I think what you've identified for me so far was two, three, and four belonging to Schneider. Correct. Do you know on the two-year-old child, was that a two-day referral a ten, or a two-day response or a 10-day response or 30-day response? What was that? I don't know. Okay. Do you, you know what I'm talking about when I say a two-day response, right? Yes. What, what does that mean? It means a time frame that um, the child abuse registry is screened that we need to see, make contact with the child and family. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when a call comes into the hotline, there's a screener there that takes the call, right? Yes. And then there's a structured decision-making tool that they run as they're assessing the call to determine whether to assign it as a two-day referral, like an immediate referral, or a 10-day referral, or I think you guys also use 30-day referrals, right? Uh, Orange County only uses immediate or 10-day. Oh, okay. And the immediate's the two-day, right? Uh, no. Okay, what is the media? Uh, with we are required to make contact with the family as soon as possible, but within 24 hours. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Thank you. So, do you know whether or not uh, item number two was an immediate response referral or a 10-day referral? No, I do not. Did you ask anybody? No. What about number three? Did you ask anybody whether that was an immediate response referral or a 10-day referral? No, I did not. So you don't know whether or not a safety, a structured decision-making safety assessment was done? No, I do not. Okay. And you didn't ask what the results of that structured decision-making safety assessment were? No. Okay. Item number four, same sort of question. The children living in the home with the mother and other residents uh, with all the drugs and knives and all that. Do you know whether that was a two or immediate, respo immediate response referral or a 10-day referral? No, I do not. And you didn't ask anybody to find out? No. And you don't know whether or not there was a structured decision-making safety assessment done before seizing the child or children? No, I did not. Okay. You didn't ask anybody? No. Okay. Same thing, the uh, child left in the hot car, item number five child left in a hot car with dangerously high temperatures at the Bram Mall and parent could not be located. I think you said that one was Christine Smith? Uh, no. No, who, who gave you that, that information? That one, Elon Wolf gave me that information. Okay, and he didn't give you the name of the social worker that handled it? 
He did not. Okay. Were you able to ascertain whether that was an immediate response referral or a 10-day referral? No. Do you know whether the invest or the referral was called in after the event? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I don't know. Okay. So you don't you don't know the time period how that worked out whether the call came in then there was an investigation then a week later they took the kid. You don't know. I don't know. Okay. And you didn't ask. Correct. I did not ask. Okay. So you don't know make sure I'm getting this right. You don't know, with respect to item number five, whether that child was seized immediately at the mall or sometime later from home or school or daycare? I do not know. Okay. Item number six, that was the sober living one. That's the one that came from Christine Smith, right? Yes. Do you know whether or not that came in on an immediate response referral or a 10-day referral? I do not. Do you know whether the, the child was seized immediately from the parent at the scene or several days later? I do not know. Okay. Do you know whether or not there was a structured decision-making safety assessment done on the child or on the situation, the child and the parent, before the seizure? No, I do not. But we do know that at that point in time, 1998, their warrants were not even on the radar yet, right? Yes. Okay. Do you know what the outcome of that was? Was there ever a determination by a court that, in fact, the allegation here was true? I don't know. Okay. And you didn't ask Mr. Uh, Wolf? No. Same with respect to all these that we've already gone through, items number one through six. You don't know whether any of these, the allegations, were actually determined by a judge to be true. Correct. I do not know. Okay. Do you know whether or not any of these children were returned to their parents? No. Do you know whether or not any of these cases were dismissed? No. Okay. So as far as you know, sitting here today, all of the scenarios laid out here remain just allegations. They're circumstances. They're allegations of circumstances. Correct. Right. As far as you know, none of them have been adjudicated by a court. I have no knowledge of that. Okay. And in fact, you don't even know whether or not the scenarios you lay out here were adequately investigated, right? Correct. And you understand that before a uh, social worker seizes a child, either with or without a warrant, they're required to conduct a thorough investigation. That's correct. Okay. You just don't know whether that happened in any of these scenarios or not, because you weren't there and you didn't ask. That's right. One year old, item number seven, one year old with health condition requiring breathing machine and smoke free environment in a home where breathing machine was not used and child was being exposed to smoke. Where'd you get that one from? Uh, that one was also provided by Elon Wolf. And who was the worker? Christine Smith. Is Christine Smith a supervisor or a worker, like line level worker? Currently or at the time? At the time. She was a uh, senior social worker at the time. Okay, so she was not a supervisor. That's my understanding. Did she become a supervisor at some point in time? She did. Is that where she is now? No. Where is she now? Uh, she's a deputy director for Children and Family Services. Oh, so she moved up pretty, pretty far. Now, this one-year-old with a health condition requiring a breathing machine and smoke-free environment in the home where the breathing machine was not being used and the child was being exposed to smoke. 
How long was it going to take for that child to die if it wasn't seized from the home right then and there? I don't know. How long was it going to take the child to suffer permanent severe bodily injury if not seized from the home right then and there? I don't know. Who was it that alleged, made the allegation that the that there was smoking going on in the home? I don't know who made the alleged allegation and if I did know I wouldn't be able to divulge the reporting party. Did this child have a brother, if you know? I don't know. Do you know when this happened? Um, I was informed by Miss Smith that it was in 1998. 1998. Okay, well, back then we didn't get warrants at all anyway, right? Sorry, that's correct. Yeah. Did you ask her anything about these spe this specific scenario, item number seven, to ascertain whether or not the child was likely to suffer a severe bodily injury within the next couple hours if it wasn't seized from its home right there and then? No. Okay. So you don't know whether... Well, did you ask her if she explored any lesser intrusive alternative means of protecting the child? Like, for instance, telling the father, hey, smoke outside, something like that? No. Didn't ask her that? No. So there might have been uh, a failure to pursue lesser intrusive alternative means here. I don't know if there was or was not. Because you didn't ask. Correct. But in your view, that would still support an exigent removal of the child, even though you don't know all the information. It could be a circumstance, yes. Okay. What sort of lesser intrusive alternative means of protecting this particular child would you instruct your social workers today to explore? Uh, I would ask them, as you had mentioned, to have them not smoke in front of the child. I would have them use the breathing machine that's required by the doctors um, or recommended by the doctors. Uh, I would ask the parents to get uh, additional, you know, have the child checked out, I guess, and make sure that they were physically safe or there was anything else that needed to be done, depending on, especially the last time that, that the child saw the doctor. I would instruct my worker um, to speak with the parents, uh, both the parents, about the allegations. Uh, I would instruct my worker to talk with um, or have our PHN nurse consultant go out with them, mm -hmm. perhaps speak um, to our child abuse expert doctor, mm -hmm. speak with the child's doctors about the current medical conditions and histories, um, work with the family to identify who, what the barriers are for them using the breathing machine, and if there was something that the parents couldn't do, who else could they identify to help them with that task to ensure that the child's um, health um, wasn't being compromised as a result of perhaps the parent's inability to um, use the breathing machine for some reason, to explore those types of things. Yeah, but that's actually, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of work that you'd go through to make sure that uh, you did explore lesser intrusive alternative means of protecting the child other than just seizing the child, right? I mean, that's a long list, right? It's a common, you know, things that we do in an investigation. Okay. And one of the reasons that you do that is because... What was that policy I gave you earlier? I think it might have been exhibit number 14. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at that just real quick. No. Well, I'm not sure which policy you're looking for, so yeah, look at exhibit, say that. Yeah, look at exhibit number 14. And I just want to make sure I, I'm correct that nowadays, the, one of the reasons that you would go through all those steps that you just listed for me is because
where there's circumstances that could be addressed or corrected if the parent were provided with, say, ex for example, um, some education or some reasonable services, then we don't want to just seize the child. We want to go ahead and provide them those services or that education or that oversight, right? Yes. Okay. Have you ever heard of a uh, case called Rogers versus County of San Joaquin? Not <clears throat> to my recollection. Okay. If you look at page 20 of exhibit number 14, First case listed there on the top of the page is Rogers versus County of San Joaquin. It's a 2007 Ninth Circuit case. See that? Yes. And what I'm wondering, is under circumstances, and, and this is prior to 2010, I want to sort of delve into your knowledge and understanding that you were relying on when you put together this declaration. Prior to the time that you got all this current warrant training and these warrant policies, prior to 2010, would it have been appropriate to seize a child without a warrant if you show up at the home and Actually, let's start the scenario over. A child's find one found wandering down the road. A referral comes in. Your social workers go to the home where that child came from, find some other kids there too. And the home is dirty, filthy. The kids have bottle rot, their diaper rash, tooth, uh, dental problems, very unsanitary, very unhealthy condition. Would that have been a circumstance under which you would be able to remove the children without first obtaining a, well actually we know you couldn't get a warrant. Would that have been a circumstance that would provide exigency to remove those children? Objection, incomplete hypothetical. Yeah, it depends. I don't know that I have enough information on all the factors, you know, that would go into making that assessment. But in your declaration here on item number seven, a one-year-old with a health condition requiring a breathing machine and smoke-free environment in a home where a breathing machine was not being used and the child is being exposed to smoke, is that enough information for you to determine whether or not an exigency exists? That's enough determination to say that that might exist. That it might exist? Mm -hmm. Yes? It's a possibility. Also, it might not exist? Correct. Okay. Interesting, we're talking about Rogers. Item number eight, lines 26 through 27, page six of your declaration. Child removed from home that was in such unhealthful and uninhabitable condition that it became red tagged and uninhabitable. Where'd you get that information? Uh, that was provided to me um, again by the agency Elon representative, Wolf. Elon Wolf, yes. And um, I spoke with the social worker on that case as well. Who was that? Was Kimberly Schneider. When did that happen? Um, trying to recall that, but she told me about that case right now. I don't recall that specific date as I sit here at this moment. Um, okay. Was it, maybe I can help you, 2009? I don't recall specifically. Let's take a quick break. Okay. Good. Do you need to grab some food? Yeah, my stomach's growling. Can you yeah. That's <laughs> hear that. You know, anytime. I'm oh, sorry. We're back on the record at 2.54. And going back to the child that was removed from the home that was in the unhealthful condition. On the break, I assume you're out there like just cogitating on that one. Probably not but in the event that you were. Were you able to recall at all what year it was that uh, 
Ms. Schneider told you this supposed removal for, or removal from an unhealthful home happened? No. Could it have been 2006? I don't know when it was. Back when you were <coughs> working first as an emergency response worker, not, not yet when you got to be a supervisor, did you ever hear at that point in time in your work of children being removed from the home based on this uninhabitable or dirty house condition? Yes. Well, was that a frequent occurrence? I don't know. Well, it happened enough that you remember it, right? Well, yes, if I've heard of it happening, yes, I right. have. And that was back when you were a uh, social worker, not yet a supervisor. Yes. Okay. Then later on, when you became a supervisor, roughly how many people did you supervise? Uh, six to eight, roughly. Okay. okay. And out of those six to eight people, we've already covered this, they had to come to you to get, a, or a supervisor, to get approval to remove a child from the home, right? Yes. Do you recall any of them ever coming to you to get approval to remove a child from the home under circumstances similar to item number eight, that is, where the home was, mm -hmm. you know, dirty house or uninhabitable? No, I don't recall. Okay. So do you recall any of the cases that were managed by your workers when you were a supervisor involving removals uh, based on, you know, a dirty house or an uninhabitable house? I don't recall any specific cases. Okay. Generally, do you recall that that sort of case happened when you were a supervisor? No. Okay, so your recollection of when that would have been happening, when children would have been being removed from the home based on, you know, the uninhabitable home conditions would have been back in, <clears throat> I think it was 2000, was it 2004? 2004 to 2007, did I get that right? 2004 to 2007, I was a social worker at the time. Okay, and that was the time where you recalled this issue of children being removed from dirty homes coming up? Yes. Okay, and it's your understanding, your, your recollection that it was during that period of time, 2004 to 2007, that at, at least you had heard of children being removed from their homes based on you know, dirty house or uninhabitable home condition. Yes. Okay. Do you have any a recollection of how frequently that was happening in that time frame, 2004, 2007? No. Okay. And do you have an, an, any mm -hmm. understanding, would those removals have been based on allegations of, well, let, let me ask it this way. Back then, 2004 to 2007, how would you have classified a child removal from the home where the removal allegations were based on uninhabitable home conditions. Uh, that, <coughs> that Objection, incomplete hypothetical, but go ahead. <coughs> uh, that would have been most likely under uh, subsection 300B. So, like a failure to protect? Failure to protect, yes. Okay. Is that neglect or is that general neglect? How would you classify it with the penal code definitions under your child abuse investigations policy? I mean, under general neglect? That'd be a general neglect. Okay. <laughs> but it's your testimony here today that to your recollection, back in that time period from 2004 to 2007, the social workers in Orange County were permitted to remove a child from the custody of its parents based on uninhabitable home conditions. Jackson misstates her testimony. Am I right about that? If the other investigation factors were taken into consideration that we discussed earlier as well as consultation and approval of the supervisor. Okay, so long, make sure I'm understanding this, so long as the supervisor approved the removal it was appropriate for a worker to remove the child from the custody of its parent based on uninhabitable, unhealthful home conditions. Objection, incomplete hypothetical. Am I right? Not entirely, no. 
Okay, let me ask you this then, because I'm, I'm not understanding. Here in paragraph 22 of your declaration at page 6, you say, there have been CFS investigations by emergency response social workers where they removed children because of neglect and there existed a reasonable belief the child was in imminent risk of serious bodily harm or death. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. Then in paragraph 23, you give some examples, specific examples, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Looking at number eight, there are no other factors listed there. It's a very simple hypothetical. Child removed from home that was in such unhealthful, uninhabitable condition that it became red tagged and uninhabitable. Did I read that right? You did. Under those conditions, am I correct that according to Orange County's practices that you engaged in at that time, 2004 through 2007, this item number eight, uninhabitable home condition, supported the seizure of the child. Objection, incomplete hypothetical. I don't have enough information to say that that's the only reason that supported, that's the only thing that supported the removal. And same here with your declaration. You, you have no basis to believe that this in fact, as it's laid out right here, would have supported a claim of exigent circumstances. I believe it would have supported it, but I don't know if it's the only factor that went into the exigent circumstances determination. See, that's where I'm having trouble because I'm using exactly the same scenario you had verbatim, the scenario you have here, and you're, you're telling me you don't have enough information to say whether or not that would be exigency or not, but then when we tag it directly to your declaration, suddenly it is an exigency. I'm confused. Please, please disabuse me of my confusion. Like I said, there's other factors that go into making that determination as well. Okay, so what were they here in I don't example know, number eight? I don't have that information. Okay, but you're able to tell just from the words here in example number eight that, yeah, that was an exigency that supported a removal. It was a reason to support an exigent removal. That standing alone, item number eight, because you don't have any other facts there. All you list are child removed from home that was in such unhealthful, uninhabitable condition that it became red tagged and uninhabitable. Those facts, nothing more, is enough to support a claim of exigency according to Orange County and you, correct? No. Objection. Okay, so then what are you saying here in your declaration? Because you're not giving me any more facts. You're saying this would it, be exigent. It's an example of uh, one of the cases that Orange County had that um, where exigency was provided. And when you say exigency was provided, what you really mean is that the supervisor who approved the removal thought that that was sufficient to support exigent circumstances, correct? Yes. Okay, you're not saying that in fact under the law those facts would support an exigency, right? Correct. And all of this, this one I think you said was 1998, right? Item number eight? No, I believe that's the one I don't, I don't recall the date of that one. Oh, okay, yeah, you know what, I have a one? note here. You ever heard of Balsitis versus County of Orange? <coughs> no. Okay, that would have been a 2006 removal based on a dirty house, you've never heard of that? No where the uh, home was actually red tagged and marked as uninhabitable by the county? Doesn't sound familiar? No. And the children were seized without a warrant? No. And the county paid money to the uh, plaintiffs for that seizure? No. And the county, ag and the county agreed to actually undertake a comprehensive review of its warrant policies as part of the settlement in that case? Doesn't sound familiar? No. Okay. Was that? You had a question I was asking, was that Orange County or what sure county was, was. that? Oh, yeah. okay. That was our friend, Mr. Spradlin. Mm. Okay, number nine. That's uh, at the bottom of page six. Children living in home with mother where the following drugs and paraphernalia were accessible to the children during investigations. And then we have a whole list of stuff. I'm not going to read them all because it's a lot. When did this happen? Uh, 2014. Okay, so that would have been the time during which we had a warrant process in effect, right? Yes. And that also would have been 
the time during which the very specific warrant training was being administered <coughs> to your social workers, right? Yes. Which means that we would have had a very specific definition of exigent circumstances, right? Yes. Very different definition of exigent circumstances than what was present before January 2010, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, if we look at paragraph 25 of your declaration, CFS and its social workers do not intend to communicate or document exigency for removal when selecting neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or any other reason as a primary removal reason in CWS CMS. First, did I read that correctly? You did. You are required to document in detail in CWS, CMS, when you believe that an exigent circumstance exists, correct? We document in the investigation narrative mm -hmm. at the emergency uh, response social worker okay. um, produces. And also in the investigation narrative, um, you identify the classification of abuse that you found there, right? Like, for example, if there's sexual abuse, you'll say sexual abuse. If there's um, neglect, you'll say neglect. If there's severe neglect, you'll say severe neglect, right? In the investigation narrative? Yes. Yes. And then when you do your coding in CWS CMS, that's on a computer, right? Not understanding what you mean by coding? Let's talk about CWS CMS. First of all, you use it, right? Yes. And when you were a line level social worker, you used it. Yes. And when you were a supervisor, you used it. Yes. Okay. And you know that there are uh, standards involved in recording information in CWS CMS, correct? Uh, the data entry standards? Is yes. that what you're referring to? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about that a little bit. When you put information into the CWS CMS database, you do that on a computer, right? Yes. You sit down and you pull it up and there's some colorful screens with some buttons that you can push to do different things, right? Yes. Okay. And one of those things you can click on lists the different types of defined abuse, right? Uh, and various screens, or are you uh, referring to any particular sure, screen? Sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, those listings, the various selections that you can make, they correlate with the definitions. What exhibit was that again? 122? Oh, it is 122. Yeah. They correlate with the various definitions that are set out at page, what page is that? At pages two and three of exhibit 122, correct? Correct. So in the CWS CMS system, when you're doing an investigation or one of your subordinate workers is doing an investigation, <coughs> they sit down in front of their computer, they bring up the screen, and they're able to pull down a drop-down menu that gives them or offers them different selections that they can mark relative to their investigation on a particular case, correct? Yes. And those selections include, let me try to get them right, include um, abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, general neglect, and severe neglect correct? Yes. And what the worker is able to do is actually click on the particular definitions that apply to that particular case, correct? Uh, the particular allegation, I'm not sure that the definition yeah. is included. Well, the definition isn't included. I agree with that. But there's a drop-down menu and there's a selection that says, for example, neglect, right? Yes. And if it's a ne neglect case, she's investigating it as neglect allegations and neglect case, 
the social worker would check neglect, right? If it's not already been checked. Right. Okay. And it would normally, who would do that initial check boxing? Uh, the child abuse registry. Okay. And that would generate the referral, right? Correct. And then the investigator would grab that referral and go out and investigate, right? Correct. And then they would come back into the office to enter their data in CWS as they developed information through their investigation, right? Correct. Okay. And if during their investigation they determine, oh, this isn't actually neglect, this is sexual abuse, they could go in and check the box that applies for sexual abuse, right? Yes. Or if they were to go out con in the converse and say, oh, hey, this isn't neglect, this is general neglect. They could check the box for general neglect, right? Yes. And then that information gets saved in the CWS CMS database associated with that particular investigation, right? Yes. Okay. And then later, people later can go back and look and say, what was this case? Was it sexual abuse? Was it general neglect? Was it neglect? What was it? Right? Correct. Okay. Do you know why? Actually, let me ask it this way, because as an administrative manager too, you probably have some involvement in this. Do you know what AFCARs are? Uh, yes. What? Uh, my knowledge is that they're uh, data, federal outcomes data that's collected okay. and reported on to the government. Okay. And do you know why it is that you're required to report that data? Um, no, not you, clearly. Well, how about generally? What do you know about why it is you're required to report uh, I that believe data? the government collects information on removals and um, number of cases that come through, et cetera. And the type of cases, right? I believe so. And the ethnic ethnicity of the particular uh, families or children? I believe that's a field also. Okay. And when we're talking about the types of cases, that the federal government requires you to report, is it your understanding, and you may, may or may not know this, I, I would think as a management position you would, but you may not. Do you know whether or not your funding levels are determined in any way by your AFCARS data? Yes, they are. They are AFCARS and it's for children place, and placed in out-of-home care is what our funding is tied to. Okay. And the AFCARS data that gets inserted into the reports, that's derived from the CWS CMS data, correct? Yes. Okay. The AFCARS reports actually require your agency, don't they, to specifically report the primary reason a child was removed, correct? For children who are placed in out-of-home care, yep. removed and placed in out-of-home care, yes. Right. And they're also, you're also required to report the secondary or any secondary reasons for removal, correct? Correct. And when you do that, The data that you're reporting is required to be limited to conditions that existed at the time of removal, not conditions that were discovered after the child was removed. Correct? Uh, I don't know what the data is entered or what that field represents there. Well, let, let me ask you, do you play any role in generating your county's AFCAR reports? No. Do you review them at all? No. How is it that you have any knowledge of their purpose? Uh, as a social worker, as a supervisor, I'm aware that this information is required and collected and reports are pulled okay. and our funding is tied to it. Okay, and you're also aware that ultimately the data comes from the CWS CMS system? Yes, the data comes from the data that's entered into CWS CMS. So it's important, isn't it, that the data, and I fa in fact, I think you get trained on this, or you train your workers now on this. It's important that the data, all of the data 
they enter into the CWS CMS system is truthful, honest, accurate, complete, right? Yes. Okay. One of the reasons it needs to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete is because these AFCAR requirements require it, right? That would make sense. Yeah, I mean, how do they fund you if they don't have an accurate assessment of what you're doing? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you exhibit number 128, and let me give her this first, and I'll give you this one. I'm not going to ask her a whole lot about it, but I don't want to have to dig well, through my books. Let me take a yours, too. Yeah. Let's see it. what it is we're doing. <clears throat> Is there a particular page you're going to point her to? Um, it should be dog-eared and highlighted. Oh, okay, there, I see. Actually. Not dog-eared. Oh, wait, down here at the bottom. I see. And if you can just take a real quick look at that, that may be a really <laughs> short line of questioning. Which? Just page. generally the document. It's titled Data Entry Standards, AFCAR's Requirements 2015. You see there? Yes. Have you ever seen a document similar to this one before? Or maybe let me ask it this way. That might be a bit too specific, maybe more general. Do you know what this document is, this exhibit number 128? Um, well, it says it's the AFCAR requirements. So it must be the standards that we're required to report on. Okay. Do you teach your workers these standards? No. Do you know if anybody teaches your workers these standards? No. Are you aware of these standards? Uh, not in its entirety. The ones that I discussed, I'm aware that we need to enter data in okay. certain fields. So you're generally aware but of this the requirements. Entire, yeah, but this entire document. No, I don't have knowledge on every single so, item in here. So you haven't like sat down and in detail studied the requirements? No, I have not. But you do have sufficient knowledge and understanding of the requirements to have answered the questions that I asked you already, right? Yes. So I don't have to go back and replow that ground. Yes. Okay. Uh, what's the first dog you page there? Uh, CO00169. Okay, and there, about the middle of the page where it says primary reason for removal, select primary reason for removal from drop down. Do you see that? The highlighted part right there. Oh, okay, yes I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, when it, where it says select primary reason for removal from drop down, do you have it, what is that referring to if you have an understanding? I believe it's referring to the placement management folder. And there's a drop down there that says to select primary reason for removal. Okay. And when we're selecting the primary reason for removal from the drop down, do you know what the definitions there are? Um, I've seen some of the drop down categories. It does mm -hmm. include um, the categories are on our WIC uh, 300 code. Okay. And that includes and general neglect. There's a couple of other ones too. Right, and that includes general neglect, correct? Correct. Okay. As its own specific set out reason. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's, you can have that. Oh, That's right. thanks. What does it mean when an allegation is substantiated? Allegations believed to be true. Okay. 
And what's the normal process that your workers follow now, today, when they're going through an investigation, putting together their investigative narrative, and deciding whether or not to substantiate a particular allegation? Uh, they would complete their, takes the, are you, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Can I have the Ask question you. we read, please? And what's the normal process that your workers follow now, today, when they're going through an investigation, putting together their investigative narrative, and deciding whether or not to substantiate a particular allegation? So they would uh, take a look at all the facts and everything that they investigated, and um, make a determination and looking also at um, the WIC code, the penal code, if they believe it's more likely than not that uh, the allegations occurred. Okay. And then in their investigation narrative, normally, I've reviewed a bunch of these, normally what I'll see is there will be, and let's just use the example where the allegation substantiated, that makes it easier to talk about. There will be allegation of sexual abuse substantiated, and then there will be a discussion of the steps that the, the particular worker took during the investigation to assemble the evidence to support that substantiation, correct? Yes. And then what happens with that when the worker substantiates an allegation of, again, sexual abuse as our example, what's the next step in terms of what she needs or he needs to do in the CWS CMS system to document that substantiation? Uh, well, they, once it was, I guess I would submit it to uh, the computer, you can go in, they have to go to that back down to that drop down mm -hmm. section that you were talking about with the allegations. There's each allegation per child and each allegation, the social worker has to make a determination on that allegation and enter it. There's a drop down box for that as well. Okay, and that drop down box would include all of the various definitions in that exhibit number 122, right? Uh, yes, yeah, some of those allegations may be there already, as we previously discussed, and right. some may be added. Okay. Okay, and some may be corrected. Correct. Okay. Do have you reviewed any of the information uh, specific to this case, to the uh, BR allegations? No. Okay. Do you know whether or not the allegations, the underlying allegations in the dependency process, do you know whether or not those were substantiated or inconclusive, unfounded? Do you know what those findings, ultimate findings were? No. Okay. Hold on. What did I do with that? I had it all set out here so that we could buzz right through it. Here it is. I'm going to show you what we'll mark as exhibit number three to your deposition. <coughs> what is a screener narrative? A screener narrative is the document that is created by the Child Abuse Registry. When they take the phone call, this is the information that the reporting party is provided to them. Okay. And is there any way that we can tell from looking at the screener narrative what type of abuse was actually being alleged? Uh, well, yes, it says the, the person who screened it does have the type of abuse alleged uh, written here on the document. And where do we find that? Uh, it's in the narrative box, I guess you would call it, and it's um, the fourth line down. Yeah, that's on page one? Page one of two. And it's right underneath location, correct? Yes. And the allegation is general neglect, correct? Correct. And when we say general neglect, that means penal code section 11165.2b, correct? Correct. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but what happens after this call comes in is the referral will get sent out to the field and assigned to an investigator to go out and actually investigate, right? Uh, it's assigned to our central assignments desk, and then that 
that desk signs the referrals out to the workers. Okay, yeah, you know what, I vaguely remember that. Every county is a little bit different, so depending on where I am, I have to rethink it. Can you tell, looking at this particular referral, whether this was an immediate response referral or a 10-day referral or what it was? Uh, yes. On the bottom of the narrative box, it's on page two. The disposition of the referral is indicated there. Oh, immediate response. That means go out right now and investigate, or as soon as practicable and investigate. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Show you what will mark as exhibit number two to your deposition. Do you rec well, you probably don't recognize that document, but what is that document? Uh, this is an uh, investigation narrative. Uh, that we use in emergency response investigation referrals. What is an investigation narrative? Um, it's basically the narrative and all everything that happened during the case of the investigation. That this, everything the social worker did during the, the investigation and other facts and items that were required to document as well. Okay. And is there any way we can tell from looking at this investigation narrative whether or not the allegations were substantiated? Uh, yes, you should be able to. It uh, should be listed here in the referral. Um, it says in the first paragraph here. That's that on page one? Page one of five in the investigation narrative mm -hmm. for Brendan Randall. Uh, was it indicates here that it was allegation of general neglect was added and substantiated. Added against mother and substantiated, correct? Um, general neglect to Brandon Randall by the mother, Jill Randall, was added and substantiated. Okay. And where it says general neglect, I note that the first letter of each of those words, first letter of general and first letter of neglect, are capitalized. Do you see that? Yes. And is that because of, uh, general neglect is a defined term? I don't know why. Okay. She capitalized it. When they're referencing general neglect here in the investigation narrative as being substantiated, what that means is that she substantiated a penal code section 11165.2b allegation, correct? And just object lacks foundation <clears throat> as to anything in this document. Well, let me ask you. We'll address the foundation. Now, today, as an administrative manager level two of ER unit one, um, you're required, aren't you, as part of your job duties to sort of monitor what your subordinates are doing and make sure that they're complying with the policies and practices of your agency, right? Correct. That includes being familiar with the various definitions, right? Yes. That includes being familiar with how these investigative narratives generally take form, right? Yes. What they're supposed to contain, right? Yes. And what they generally should look like, what components should be in each one of them. Correct. Okay. Generally speaking, as this investigation narrative inform what you would expect to see of your subordinate workers here today? Uh, can I? I haven't reviewed the whole oh, yeah, investigation absolutely. narrative, so absolutely. I don't do, do know what what's contained in here as far sure. as formatting. Uh -huh. Is that what you're asking about is formatting? Well, I, I'm assuming that during your time with the agency, you yourself have written investigation narratives, right? Yes. You've reviewed investigation narratives of your subordinate workers when you, certainly when you were a supervisor in ER, right? Yes. And I don't know now as an administrative manager too, do you still review your subordinates' investigation narratives? Maybe on occasion? On occasion, but not, um, not normally. Okay. So, but you have enough experience with them that you are familiar with 
what should be contained in an investigation narrative and where you should be able to find it, right? Yes. And what's meant by the various terms they use in the investigation narrative, right? Yes. So here where she says general neglect was substantiated, we're talking about Penal Code Section 11165.2b, general neglect, right? Rejection yeah. calls for speculation as to what Myesha Hammond thought when she wrote that down. Go ahead. Normally, uh, yes, you would look at the penal code in the WIC 300B code for neglect. Okay. And then when this data is entered into the CWS CMS system, um, would the worker normally go through that same process we talked about earlier where they pull down the drop down menu and then click a box to describe or to indicate what was actually substantiated? The worker does, uh, to close out the referral, they do go in and mark down, or the drop down box, um, if they, what their findings were to each allegation. Okay, so for example, on, on this one, if, we, if I had the CWS system in front of me and I had that, that drop down menu open, mm -hmm. I would expect to see, if I'm in a management position, let's say, and I'm supervising my worker, I would expect to see the checkbox for general neglect general neglect checked, right? If that's um, the allegation they're being investigated, they're investigating, yes. Okay, and in this particular instance, exhibit uh, numbers two and three, that is the particular allegation that was being investigated, right? It was general neglect. It was an allegation that was added to the original well, allegations. It's let's look back at exhibit what three. What this says. Let's look back at exhibit three. What was the allegation there? That was says general neglect. Right. So that was the allegation that was actually referred out for investigation was general neglect, right? Yeah. And it calls for speculation from this witness. Just in looking at this screener narrative, based on your management experience, would that be the allegation that was sent out for investigation, general neglect? Yes. Okay. Same thing based on your management experience the allegation that was substantiated in this particular investigation. That's on Exhibit 2. Would that be general neglect? Yes. So based on your experiences of, in a management position with the agency, when you go look at that CWS information to double check to make sure that it was inputted accurately into the system, you would expect to see the box for general neglect checked, right? Checked an incomplete hypothetical. Calls for speculation from this witness. Go ahead. If it was entered correctly, yes, you would see it. Okay. And you already talked to me about how important it is that the data entered into the CWS CMS system be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, right? Yes. That includes being entered correctly, right? Yes. Okay. Do you have systems in place or procedures in place to ensure that your workers actually are entering the data correctly? A uh, supervisor would review that, mm -hmm. and so it depends on supervisor review at the time of closure of the case. Okay, but as a matter of policy, the supervisors are required, in fact, to review that to make sure it's done accurately. Yes. Okay. And also the workers themselves, they get training on how to correctly enter the data into the CWS system, correct? Yes. Okay. So from a management perspective, now, today, when you look at the data in the CWS CMS system relative to you know, your management responsibilities over your workers, do you feel confident, or at least a reasonable measure of confidence, in the data that you see there? Yes. Okay. Where is that big? one that we were talking about earlier. There it is. Looking at exhibit number 123, it's going to be at the very back end of it. I don't know why they didn't make this a bigger font. They don't understand that I'm becoming blind as a bat.
55. I'm looking at, I'll highlight it for this and make it easier. I don't need this clip too. Much. Okay, looking at exhibit number 123, page 55. You see at the top of the page it says removal by year and primary reason or removal reason. You see that? Yes. And one reason per removal. You see that? Yes. And you see then there's some years, 1995 all the way through 2015. Yes. On the far right hand side, see general neglect? Yes. Do you have any understanding that the numbers listed there under general neglect year by year are the number of removals by Orange County social workers in each of the identified years based on general neglect? Objection lacks foundation calls for speculation from this witness. Go ahead. Uh, I didn't know that previously, no. Did you ever, have you ever in your management position, have you ever talked to anybody about the quantity, that is the number of removals each year that you guys do based on the various abuse types? No. Okay. That's not part of your job duties to know how many removals your people are doing? I think uh, that's something that's good to be aware of and since I've only been there two months I haven't gotten into that quite yet. That's fair. Uh, what about when you were a supervisor? Did you track the number of removals that your workers were doing? No. And now as a, in a management position, what about warrants? Do you track the number of warrants that your people get? No. Is there a reason why you don't? I don't know if we have a mechanism to, to track that or not. Again, might be something that I'm just not familiar, quite familiar with yet. Okay. Let's take a couple minutes break. We are off record at 3.37. We are back on the record at 3.51. Okay, going back for a moment just to talk about general neglect and its definition. Um, am I correct that because circumstances of general neglect are specifically defined as not including physical injury, that an allegation of general neglect standing alone will never support a finding of exigent circumstances? No, I don't believe so. Really? Explain to me. If we have no, no physical injury, how do we get to exigency where exigency is defined as specific and articulable evidence to show that the child will suffer severe bodily injury or death in the two hours it takes to get a warrant? I'm going to object to the extent you're misrepresenting the <coughs> definition of general neglect. How's general neglect defined? It's defined as they're not... No, I'm not asking you. Okay, all right. I'm asking your well, witness... Well, you're going to ask her I'm asking your witness who signed a declaration mm -hmm. under penalty of perjury, how's general neglect defined according to you and your agency? Uh, general neglect is failure to project and uh, can lead to circumstances where a child might be at risk for physical abuse, can I uh, see that sexual abuse, exhibits, please? <coughs> medical issues. <laughs> oh, I hate to do this to you. According to your formal policies that are set down in writing, how is general neglect defined?
general neglect is the, we covered this already, negligent failure of a person having the care and custody of a child to provide adequate food, clothing, shelter, medical care, or supervision where no physical injury occurred to the child has occurred. Okay. Is the word sexual abuse anywhere in that definition that is written up in your policies? For the definition of general neglect yeah. written up in our policies, uh -huh. no. Okay, is uh, uh, failure to protect There's another, okay. uh, This is, no, that's the mm -hmm. neglect code. Mm -hmm. And we've already discussed this, neglect is very different from general neglect by definition. Yes? I'm not sure it's very different, but it is different. Well, one specifically excludes physical injury, right? The general neglect yes. definition does. It does, and it doesn't say anything in there about failure to protect, right? Do the words failure to protect appear anywhere in your policy definition of general neglect? No. Do the words sexual abuse appear anywhere in your policy definition of general neglect? No. Do any words other than the ones present there in Exhibit 122 at page, what page is that? 3 of 25. 3 of 25 reflect anything other than a situation where there is no physical injury? No. So can we all agree that general neglect involves a situation where a situation that is the negligent failure of a person having the care or custody of a child to provide adequate food, clothing, shelter, medical care, or supervision where no physical injury to the child has occurred. Can we all agree that that is what we mean when we're talking about general neglect, at least according to Orange County's policy? Yes. And the written policy of the county, that's the county's policy, right? That's it. That's the county policy? Yeah. Correct. And that's, that's the rule you guys follow, is the county policy, right? Yes. Okay. So, am I correct then that physical injury, there is a physical injury requirement when we're assessing whether or not exigent circumstances exist, correct? Objection, uh, vague and ambiguous as to physical injury having occurred or risk of physical injury occurring. Go ahead. Uh, physical injury is part of, or risk of physical injury is also part of the eminent risk. Is a hospital hold a seizure according to Orange County's policies? Yes. Okay. Meaning that you're required to get a warrant unless there is an exigent circumstance, correct? Correct. Okay. Am I also correct that a social worker cannot create an exigency by waiting until the moment of release before Co seizing the child? Uh. I don't know if that's in our policy, but that would make sense. That, that would be correct. Okay, that would be your expectation. Yes, it's my expectation. Okay. Now we know there's three exceptions to the warrant requirement, right? Exigent circumstances, consent, prior judicial authorization. Correct. Okay. The definition for exigency, we've talked a, a little bit about that. It requires a specific articulable evidence to show that the child is in immediate danger of sustaining severe physical injury or death in the time it takes to get a warrant, correct? Yes. 
and it requires um, that specific articulable evidence requirement means we can't speculate. We can't seize a child based on hunches or speculations about future injury, correct? We have to have specific articulable facts to show it. Yes. Okay, so we, we don't guess, we don't speculate, we don't operate on hunches, right? Correct. Okay. Imminent means that immediate attention is required, correct? Yes. No delays. In fact, a delay in removing a child when you think there's an exigent circumstance will undermine any claims of exigency, right? Correct. And then the most important thing we consider is whether or not there is time to get a warrant, right? Yes. Physical injury requirement, again, emotional abuse standing alone is insufficient to support a claim of exigent circumstances, correct? I think it would depend. It's the same answer I gave before. I mean, I could, there might be some circumstances where it would be exigent circumstances. And that's your position today, 2017, based on your current training and as a, in a management position for the agency. It's your position that em allegations of emotional abuse standing alone can be sufficient to support an unwarranted seizure of a child, correct? Yes. When's the last time that you authorized a warrantless seizure based on emotional abuse? I haven't. But you've heard of it happening? No. Well, I think you did tell me earlier that you heard of it. Somebody was doing it back in 2007 or something when you were a supervisor. Is that right? Objection to states or testimony. Go ahead. It's possible that that would have happened before the warrants. Okay. Why do you think that? I'm just saying it's a possibility. Okay. I don't have any reason to believe. And it's your position, I want to make sure I get this right, it is your position as a administrative manager level two of an ER unit, ER one, that today, 2017, allegations of general neglect will support a unwarranted seizure of a child. Depending on the circumstances. Okay. Like what circumstances? There's no physical injury to they the child. They have to be, I mean, hypothetical cases that, that could occur. See, that's where I'm having trouble. I'm not really understanding how. You're misreading the definition, Sean. That's why. Okay. I'm misunderstanding the, the definition. Well, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. We're looking at failure to provide adequate food. Right? Let's look at that broken down the first component. Failure to provide adequate food. But the child's suffering no physical injury, right? That's one of the circumstances, right? That's that you're providing neglect. me in the hypothetical, right? Well, no, general neglect is specifically defined as the negligent failure of a person having the care or custody of a child to provide adequate food. That's one of the circumstances in the definition, right? Yes. Okay, how long does it take a child to starve to death? I don't know. And is starvation something that can be cured, say, by a hamburger? Objection. Calls for expert opinion. Yeah. Based on your 17 years as a social worker, is malnutrition something that can be addressed within a couple hours? Objection. Incomplete hypothetical. Go ahead. I, yeah, that's out of my scope of practice, as I don't know the malnutrition, how that gets... Um, cured mm -hmm. necessarily uh, so I I don't can't really respond to the malnutrition but yes if you give the child some food mm -hmm. that that would help the situation and that's something that we could address as a lesser intrusive alternative means within the few hours it takes to obtain a warrant correct yes okay same with adequate clothing that's something we could address within a few hours right yes shelter that's something we could address Child isn't going to die from Depends. lack of shelter in a couple hours, is it? Typically. Uh, in the time to take it to get a warrant. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Medical care. 
medical care. How about that? Depends on what the child's medical needs are, what the circumstances are. Well, if we're looking at serious medical needs, that would be covered under severe neglect, wouldn't it? Where it's health endangering? Uh, it could be. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit already about Rogers versus County of San Joaquin. In your review of the policies and the various training and the trainings that you've had, have you ever heard of a case called Baker versus County Los Angeles? No. Starving child, failure to thrive, seized without a warrant? No. Not adequate basis? General no. neglect? Have I heard of that Never case? heard of that? No. Okay. They didn't teach you anything about that in your training? No. Okay. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, I don't know. I will show you what we will mark as exhibit number 129, your deposition. <coughs> it might be mine. Is that the one I highlighted? Yeah, I think that's the one of the trade. Just take a moment to review that document, if you would. Do you have a complete document? I don't. It seems this like is, it's just this is all random, random pages from... This is all they gave me. I've got pages three, let's see what you guys have, five, six, 20, 27, 28, 29, and 45. You done? I flipped through the pages. Did you want me to read them all fully? Um, you might want to read them because I think that, well, let me ask you this first. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Maybe you don't need to read them. Do you recognize the concepts addressed here in exhibit number 129? Well, there it's talking about case law federal law, hospital holds. Is that what you're meaning by the headings? Do I recognize the headings or have I seen this document before? Well, I'm not clear about the question. I, I don't know if you see Have you seen this document before or a document that contained images like this before? No. Okay. So then we'll drop down to the second question. Have you seen a document or uh, had participated in any training where the concepts depicted here were addressed in that training. And for that, you may actually need to read the slides to answer that question. The slides of the training she took? No, the, the slides that are in front of her. My question was, have, actually, can I have my question reread? Maybe you don't need to read it. Have you seen a document where it had participated in any training where the concepts depicted here were addressed in that training? And for you, you may actually need to read the slides to answer that question. Have you had any training regarding the concepts depicted here in Exhibit 129? I'm sure, yes, I've had trainings on some of these, but I'm not sure if I've been trained on all of them. Okay, let's, let's do this then. Let's try to figure out which ones you have been trained on. Let's look at... And I'm not sure like when this training happened, if this uh, was the information I was trained on or not. I understand. I don't know where this training comes from. I haven't gotten to when, and it doesn't matter where it comes from. I can show her a, a writing on a napkin. 
to refresh her recollection or inform That's her fine, of the question. So that doesn't even matter. Don't coach the witness. Let's just go through this. Page, okay. page number three of Exhibit 129. Um, do you recognize any of the concepts depicted here on page three? Uh, no, I've not seen this before. How about county policy is to obtain warrants on all cases unless one of the three condition one of three condition exists consent exigency or prior judicial authorization first did I read that correctly yes is that a concept you've had training on yes okay this policy will address how to investigate child abuse referrals and protect children while ensuring that state and federal legal requirements are met is that first that i read that correctly yes is that a concept you've had training on on um, i'm not sure which policy they're referring to so i so you have not had training on a policy i've had training on policies but i don't know which one there okay. have you had training on any policy any policy that addresses how to investigate child abuse referrals and protect children while ensuring that state and federal legal requirements are met. I'm not sure that I've had a training on one policy per se. Really? Have you had training on Exhibit number 14. Uh, exhibit number 14 is a warrants policy. Have you had training on it? Um, I've had training on warrants. You haven't had training on that specific policy? But we didn't go through the, the specific policy step by step. Oh, well let me make sure I'm understanding this. You have never, in terms of training, been trained on that specific policy step by step. Is that right? Am I understanding you right? I've had trainings, uh, warrant training that included items listed in this policy, but I don't know if every item that's listed in this policy was included in the training. Okay, hold on. That doesn't really answer my question. Can I have my question reread, please? And Zach, just because so, we didn't pick that up on the camera, he's talking to the witness while the question's pending nodding his head and not making mouth movements, things like that. Go ahead. You have never, in terms of training, been trained on that specific policy step by step. Is that right? Am I understanding you right? Sort of a yes or no question. Am I right or wrong? Uh, yeah, I think you would be right. Okay, and that's even today, 2017, in your management position, right? Correct. Okay. Going to page number five of Exhibit 129, constitutional and federal laws. Have you been trained that the Fourth Amendment search and seizure law applies to the work you're doing with children in terms of taking them away from their homes? Yes. Okay. Have you been trained that the 14th Amendment applies to that work? Yes. Have you been trained that the 5th Amendment applies to that work? I don't recall that one. Okay. Have you been trained that under 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, you or your subordinate social workers can incur civil liability when you seize a child without first obtaining a warrant? Yes. So you have been trained at least to on several of the concepts depicted here on page five, correct? Yes. Case law summarized, page six of exhibit number 129. You're familiar with Calabretta v. Floyd, right? Yes. And you've heard of Mabe versus County of San Bernardino? Yes. Wallace versus Spencer? I don't recall that one. Um, let me see if I can help you. 
looking at exhibit number 14, page 19 of 20, third paragraph down. You see that there? Yes. Wallace versus Spencer? Yes. That's Orange County's policy, exhibit number 14, the one that's currently in effect? Yes. Okay. Do you recall reading that at some, I think you did tell me you read it a couple months ago, right? Uh, I read through the policy a few months ago. And when you read through the policy, did you read all the way to the end? I don't recall. I think I okay. kind of flipped through. Do you, do you recall now that you've seen it, having read at least the little blurb there about Wallace versus Spencer? No, I do not. Okay. And you don't recall in any training um, that particular case, Wallace versus Spencer, having been taught to you? I do not. Okay. What about Rogers versus County of San Joaquin? Uh, I don't have any specific memory or recollection of that okay. uh, being trained. Can you find it there in exhibit number 14, Orange County's policy? And then just tell me what page it's on. I think since it was later in time. Uh, I'm not seeing it actually. All right. Since it was later in time, it will probably be after Wallace versus Spencer, would be my guess. Yeah, here you go. Page 2020. See that there? Rogers versus County of San Joaquin? Oh, yes, I do see that now. Okay. Uh, you just don't recall being specifically trained about Rogers versus County of San Joaquin, right? Correct. That was the dirty house takings. You need to get a warrant to take a kid out of a dirty house. Do you right. remember something like that? I do not remember that, no. Okay. And what about school interviews of children? Did you ever learn anything in this current training maybe about whether or not you need a warrant to interview children at school? Uh, there are circumstances where you do need a warrant is what I've been told. Okay. And did you learn about that in training? I uh, believe I first heard about that in training, yes. Okay. And in that training, did they mention to you a case called Green versus Camretta? I don't know if they mentioned it in that training or it was a different training, but I have heard of that case before. Of Green versus Camretta? Yes. So other than Wallace versus Spencer and Rogers versus County of San Joaquin, the concepts addressed here on page six are concepts that you've been trained on? Yes. Going to page 20 of exhibit number 129, hospital holds. First one, a hold is a seizure subject to the Fourth Amendment. I think we've already been over this. You have been trained that, in fact, a hospital hold is a seizure subject to the, the prescription of the Fourteenth Amendment or Fourth Amendment, right? Yes. Uh, and we talked about this too. Social workers should not wait until moment of release to create exigent circumstances, right? Yes. If the social worker has evidence to show that there's a problem while the child's still in the hospital. The social worker has to act right away, right? As soon as the social worker realizes that there is an issue they're concerned about, yes. Right. Can't wait until the child's going to be released and then say, oh, my God, there's an exigency, right? Correct. Uh, what about this one? Mere fact mother uses illegal narcotics and baby tested positive does not automatically create imminent danger of physical harm. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. Is that something that you've also learned in your training? Yes. Okay, so all of the concepts here depicted on page 20 are concepts as to which you have received training, right? Yes. Was that training training that you received in 2012 or prior? I don't recall. Okay. okay exhibit number 129, page 27. Exceptions, three exceptions. Well, first of all, just looking at this, is this a slide, uh, the concepts depicted on this slide, are they concepts you've received training on? Yes. Okay. Let's just switch then to exhibit number 28. Exigency, first exception. First, did I read that right? Yes. First bullet point, imminent danger of serious physical injury. Is that a concept that you've been trained on? Yes. Second bullet point requires probable cause, reasonable suspicion, reasonable belief. Is that a concept you've been trained on? Yes. And as to both of these concepts, or we talked about the 2012 training? I believe so. I don't recollect exactly. Okay. And then imminent, the third bullet point, imminent, requires immediate attention, call supervisor, law enforcement, but no other delays. Is that a concept you've been trained on? 
Yes. Okay. And again, you think that was the 2012 training? Seems reasonable. Okay. Can't leave, next bullet point down, can't leave and return unless you learn new information. First, did I read that right? Yes. Okay. Is that a concept that you've been trained in terms of delay, that you, you can't leave and return and claim an exigency unless there's new information that would support the exigency? Can't leave where? Well, What is that implying? Let's say you're out on an investigation. You say, oh my God, there's an issue here with this child. You walk away, come back several hours later. Can you seize that kid? No. Okay, because there's no exigency anymore, right? Correct. Unless when you come back, you learn new information, right? New information that supports an exigency. Right. And that's something that you were trained in that 2012 training? Yes. Okay. Uh, then here where it says, nevertheless, is there time to obtain a warrant? Question mark. Did I read that right? Yes. You have been trained that always, even if there's an exigency, you have to ask yourself, is there time to get a warrant, right? Yeah, correct. Okay, so you have been trained on that concept. Yes. Next one, physical injury requirement. We've talked a little bit about this, and I think this is where we're struggling. Physical injury requirement, general neglect, emotional abuse is insufficient. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. And you don't recall ever being trained that, correct? Not specifically. How about generally? Uh, I don't recall. Well, specifically, this is the problem I'm having, and I'll explain it to you, is people generally, they want to be honest. So what they'll do is they'll give what I call hook words in their answers so that they can give what feels like an honest answer, but there's a hedge or a hook. From my perspective, it's a hook. Things like, I don't specifically know, I don't specifically recall. Specifically is a hook word. It tells me that there's something there, maybe more general, but you don't really want to give it to me. So that's what I'm looking for. I know you don't specifically recall. Generally, do you recall in some sense? No, I do not recall. Okay. Immediate response referral does not confer exigency. First, did I read that correctly? Correct. And have you, you been trained that just because it's an immediate response referral does not mean there's an exigent circumstance? Correct. Okay, so other than bullet point one, two, three, four, six on slide number 28, you have been, you do have a recollection of having been specifically trained on these concepts. Yes. You just don't remember specifically whether you were trained on this concept that general neglect and emotional abuse are insufficient basis for exigency, right? Correct. Okay. Might have been trained it, you just don't remember. That's right. Okay. I think this is the last one. No, close to the last one. We're getting there. Exigent circumstances consist of imminent danger. SW must separate seriousness of the allegations from the time element. Imminent circumstances require an immediate response. If SW has time, warrant needed. First, did I read that correctly? You did. And that's the concept that you were trained on in 2012, right? Yes. Okay. Reasonable cause, specific articulable. That's in reference to the evidence you need to support the removal, right? Yes. And I think we talked a lot about that this morning. You have been trained on that concept? Yes. And that was in the 2012 training? Yes. How about this one? Reliable evidence must corroborate anonymous referrals. First, did I read that right? Yes, you did read that correctly. Is that a concept that you recall having been trained on? I don't recall. Okay. Does it sound familiar? Uh, it makes sense, but I don't remember if that was something I received in training or not. Why does it make sense? Oh, yeah, I, I misspoke. I was thinking about anonymous, um, something, something different than anonymous referrals. I misspoke. So you do remember having been trained this concept? I don't remember being trained in this concept, no. And it doesn't make sense? Uh, I 
think what it's speaking to is that if you have an anonymous reporter calling mm -hmm. a referral in, mm -hmm. that we have to investigate and, co and cooperate the information being provided. Okay, so is corroborate. That, I'm not sure where this is coming from, I guess. Okay. I, sk I think I'm still confused. So when you say you, have, you would have to corroborate the information from an anonymous source, do you mean corroborate independently? Yes, okay. to do, go out and do your investigation and make contact with the okay. family, the victims, other people involved, other people who may know the family or have some reasonable knowledge about the circumstances. And make sure that whoever this anonymous person is, that what they're saying is actually what's going on. Correct. Okay, and that's something you've been trained on, or yes. trained to do. Yes. Okay. okay, the last one, we made it, um, of exhibit number 129, last page, page number 45, before detaining must consider. Can child remain safely at home? That's something you've been trained about, right? Yes. And I think this probably, the balance of this slide goes to the issue of lesser intrusive alternative means. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, because we're looking at reasonable services, referral to public assistance, non-offending caregiver, the alleged perpetrator voluntarily agrees to leave, those are all concepts you've been trained on, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's there. I can get rid of that. Okay, we got that. Going back to your declaration, just for a moment, exhibit A, those I think it was 11 scenarios that you laid out. Is this my pile here? Yeah. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Oh. Yeah. yeah, those 11 scenarios, I think it was 11. Should have this burned in my brain by now. Yeah, those 11 scenarios that you laid out in Exhibit A, beginning at or actually contained in paragraph number 23 at page 6. The first one there, infant who's nearly suffocated, which definition would that fall under? If you could help me out with that. That uh, would more than likely fall under uh, general neglect. Really? Nearly suffocated under the influence of an unknown substance and became unconscious is going to be general neglect. She nearly suffocated her baby, and that's general neglect. Is that your testimony? It could be general neglect. It could be, or it, it could, would be? It would, could come in as general neglect, okay. uh, depending on let's, if there was any medical condition or let's do it this way. severe, you know, any kind of other things. But you don't know if there were any kind of other things, because you don't have them listed here, yeah. right? I don't know what this came in as. Okay. This is a, my let's just do this. best guess. Let's just do this, because you don't tell us any other circumstances here so that we can determine whether there's something there or not, right? That's correct. Okay, so you're the social worker, you're the investigating social worker, and you seized this child, this infant, who was nearly suffocated by its mother, who was under the influence of an unknown substance and became unconscious while you were there. What is the specific allegation you're gonna make there? Action incomplete hypothetical. Which classification is it? Is it going to be child abuse? Is it going to be physical abuse? Sexual? We know it's not going to be sexual abuse, right? Correct. We know it's not going to be emotional abuse, right? Correct. Is it going to be physical abuse, maybe? No. It won't be physical abuse. She's suffocating her child. It's not going to be physical abuse. No. Okay. Neglect? Could it be neglect? I think that's what I testified to before, is I believe this is neglect. Neglect, okay. And is that in part because with the suffocation there's strong potential of physical injury? I 
think the neglect part stems from the mother's inability to provide supervision to the child. That would keep the child safe and free from risk. So it's the fact that she passed out, not the fact that she suffocated her child that you're focusing on, right? Um, my, that she suffocated the child. Um, well, that's not inability to provide care, is it? That's actually physical injury. She, um, the referral, the statement here also says that she became unconscious and unresponsive well, while under the influence of known substances. And under the influence and of... And during that time, she suffocated her baby. Okay, well, that's not negligence, or, is it? That's, that's like taking drugs, passing out, and suffocating your baby. That's not negligent, is it? That's intentional. It's, it's negligent. It was intentional for the mother to suffocate her baby. Is, was it intentional? Is that what you're saying? Was it intentional for her to take drugs? Objection, argumentative. I don't know. Well, actually, you don't know from this allegation. I don't know. Okay, let's look at number two. Two-year-old child found running in the street unsupervised. Which one does that fall under? Uh, that would also fall under neglect. What about number three? Six-year-old child whose mother and father kept drugs in the house accessible to the child and mother would blow methamphetamine smoke into the child's face while laughing. Which one would that fall under? Neglect. Okay. Number four. Children living in a home with mother and other residents in which the following were found. Heroin, loose syringes with no caps, two methamphetamine pipes, open bladed knives, a scale and pack, it sounds like they're selling drugs, a loaded gun and knife in the den by the children's video games. Which one would that fall under? Neglect. Okay. Child number five, a child left in a hot car with dangerously high temperatures at the Brea Mall and parent could not be located. Which one would that fall under? Could be neglect or severe neglect. Okay. Do we know what the temperatures were? I don't know. It didn't ask? No. Okay. Uh, number seven, one year old with health condition requiring breathing machine, smoke free environment and home where a breathing machine was not being used. Child was being exposed to smoke. Which one would that fall under? Could fall under neglect or severe neglect. Okay. Nine, children living in home with mother where the following drugs and paraphernalia were accessible to the children and it lists all kinds of stuff there. Uh, what would that fall under? Neglect. Then number 10, sounds like that one would just fall under crazy. Um, but by your definition, which one would that fall under? Could fall under neglect and uh, possibly also caretaker incapacitated. Okay, caretaker incapacitated. Where, what is caretaker, oh I see, is it, is that part of the definition of neglect? Care, caretaker in, incapacitated? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Why would it not be? Well, I guess they haven't. There's no evidence here yet that the mother has inflicted physical abuse, right? Is that why it's not physical abuse? For number 10? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Had she actually done something like tried to scrape the bugs out of the baby's skin, then you would be looking at physical abuse, right? It would be taken under consideration. And what would she have to do to call it physical abuse? Cause injury to the child. So scraping the kid's skin off to get the bugs out would be an injury, right? Yes. And that would qualify as physical abuse, right? If the scraping caused an injury, yes. Okay. Um, number 11, the three-year-old stepping on a syringe full of heroin, what would we classify that one as? Neglect. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like all 11 of these pretty much would be classified as neglect or severe neglect. Yes. Okay. This is yours, I think. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm not going to walk away with documents. Okay. So that's that.
Going back for a moment to the primary and secondary reasons for removal, we talked about this already a little bit, but one of the reasons that you're required to select a primary and secondary reason for removal is because that is the data that the federal government relies on in the AFCARS reports, right? That's my understanding. Okay. So that's actually important that that be correctly coded, right? The primary and secondary reasons for removal? I don't know for a fact. I mean, I don't, I would assume that it would be, but I don't know how, what role that plays in the funding stream. Right, but that's not really the question. You've actually had training that when you're inputting this information into the CWS CMS system, that the proper identification of the form of abuse is coded properly. I haven't received that training. I don't recall okay. that training. So nobody's ever trained you that the data you put into the, the CWS CMS system, including the identification of the type of allegations, is that you're required to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete in doing that? You haven't had that training? Uh, you're, we, of course, you're required to be truthful and accurate in the data that you enter. And, that includes, that. and that includes the identification of the type of abuse, right? Uh, on that if, little drop-down menu that we checked yes, box? Yes, whoever enters that, sh that information should be, enter it correctly. Yeah. Okay. Now, in your, I think you talked about this actually, in your investigation narrative or in a social worker's investigation narrative that's where they're required to actually set out the specific facts and circumstances that they believe create exigent circumstances right yes okay but they are required to input that data into the cws system right the investigation narrative is, uh, yes, in, in created inside CWS CMS. Right, and the data they put into that investigation narrative is then stored in the CWS CMS system, correct? Yes. And it's your understanding that the CWS CMS system is actually a statewide database operated by the state of California, CDSS, correct? Correct. Okay. Have you ever heard of the uh, Child Welfare Indicators Project at Berkeley? UC Berkeley? I don't believe so. Okay. No. You've never heard of that? I know that Berkeley does research stuff okay. tied with our agency, but I don't have any direct knowledge of any specific. Do you have any understanding about specific. how they get their data? Uh, no. Okay. All right, when you, back when you were a supervisor of emergency response workers, did you ever discipline in any way anyone who removed a child from the custody of its parents without, let me ask it this way, because we know you didn't get warrants back then. Did you ever discipline in any way, whether it be counseling, reprimand, informal reprimand, in any way? one of your subordinate workers for removing a child where the allegation was general neglect? No. And we know that back then there was no warrant process in place so even though the allegation was for general neglect no warrant would have been obtained, correct? Correct. Okay. Well to clarify, you weren't a supervisor until 2012, right? Yes. Okay. R Oh, yeah. so the, I think, yeah. the timing's wrong That's on that. It's been a long day. Back when you were a social worker, ER emergency response worker, did you ever, had you ever heard of anyone being disciplined in any way for removing a child from the custody of its parents based on general neglect allegations? No. Okay. Since you became a supervisor, 2012, have you yourself ever disciplined a subordinate worker in any way 
for removing a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? No. Have you ever heard of, in your entire career, 17 years, have you ever heard of an emergency response worker being disciplined in any way for removing a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? No. Have you ever heard of a emergency response worker being disciplined in any way for being inaccurate in their recording of information in the CWS CMS system? No. Have you ever heard of a emergency response worker being disciplined in any way for being dishonest in reports that they made to the court? No. And other than the Milligan Cole case, have you ever been sued in your capacity as an employee of the County of Orange? No. That was the only one? Yes. Do you know anybody who has been sued who's an employee of the County of Orange for removing, specifically for removing a child without first obtaining a warrant? No, I mean, we don't talk about them the lawsuits that are going on, so it's not something that's shared. I'm not, <coughs> that. not I haven't heard of that okay. in my recollection. All right. We need that. <coughs> oh yeah, this was one that we we're gonna think about. Let's do it. That way I don't have to get worry about it. I'll show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 100. This one I've got a whole bunch of copies of. Also, I've got one for you too. <coughs> I don't expect that you've seen the first page of exhibit 100 before, <coughs> but the second page of exhibit 100, what is that? It's, um, and just to be clear, I think it starts at the very bottom of the first <coughs> page and then ends on the second page. Oh, so it bleeds over? Yeah, I think that's... Well, I think the email... Oh, part of an email. Right, right, right. Right. The from sent yeah, to subject saying, and then yeah. the body of the email is on the next page. Right, I got it. <coughs> God, excuse me. So what is this? Uh, it's a copy of an email that was sent out um, on March 10th, 2010 to Children and Family Services staff and a couple of other individuals named here. The subject of the email is PDU information update. What is a half warrants, half hyphen warrants. What is a PDU information update? Policy <laughs> development unit. Do you or have you ever? PDU, I'm sorry. That's what PDU stands for. Have you ever received one of these before? Uh, yes, they send out emails every time that they have an update on a policy. Okay, and that would be in all of your positions, whether it, it was as a line worker or even now as a uh, in a management position. You still receive policy development unit updates whenever there's an update in policy. Uh, it depends on what where you're assigned, mm -hmm. Children and Family Services uh, does. Um, other divisions of social service agency, I'm not sure what their operating standards are, and if you're assigned to a different division, you wouldn't receive another division's policy update email. I got you. So only during the time frame that you were with Children and Family Services would you receive this type of policy update? As long as I was on their uh, distribution list, that they have listed here as Children and Family Services staff. In 2010, were you with Children and Family Services? I was. Okay, so you would have received this policy update? Uh, likely, yes. <clears throat> and can you tell in looking at it 
when it was that you would have received the policy update? Well, the email says it was sent out on March 10, 2010. Okay. So would that have been the first time that you knew anything about? Now, I recognize you don't remember receiving this, right? Correct. Okay. Looking back at your position then, would March 10th then, could we assume reasonably that March 10th would have been the first time that you would have been informed about this particular policy development unit information update? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> You're not going to know anything about this. We'll get rid of that. Oh. Um, do you really need to do that? I'll show you what will mark as exhibit number 131 to your deposition. You recognize exhibit number 131? Oops, wrong one. <clears throat> um, not, no. Do you know what exhibit number 131 is? Looks like a desk guide or some sort of training guide for creating a case plan in CWS CMS. What's a case plan? Uh, it's laid out a uh, family, um, I guess, things that with the court has ordered what the family would like to address or things also that social services may be uh, requesting the family to address or services to um, participate in and uh, goes to court with the court reports, uh, the case plan does, and if it's approved by the judge and those services are ordered by, um, for the family, the parents, the child to complete. Okay, so the case plan, correct me if I'm wrong, would be an important document? Uh, yes. And it's an official document that's generated by your agency, right? Yes. And then it's, I think you said it'll be attached to a report and filed with the court? It's attached to the court reports the court. Um, for certain reports <coughs> that require case plans. Okay. And then those are filed with the court? Yes. Okay. Looking at the suggested case plan elements, you see the second thing down here, it says primary intervention reasons? Yes. What does that mean? Uh, means that those are the primary reasons why um, social services is involved with a particular family okay. and, or case. And is this um, something that the social workers are required to depict in the case plan? That is the primary intervention reasons? I don't recall. Okay. And looking at the primary intervention reasons listed here at page 01246, you see emotional abuse there? Yes. And you see general neglect there? Yes those two terms in the context of a case plan, how are they defined? Are they defined the same as what's written in that policy exhibit number 122? That would be this one here. Uh, I don't know how they're defining them. There's no explanation here. Okay, and in your capacity, in your management capacity, that you serve in today, you have no idea how those are defined within the context of a case plan. Am I right? I could surmise that they're associated to the allegations as to why the child was brought into protective custody. And how are those terms defined? That was the question. Oh, um, they're defined through WIC, uh, the WIC 300 codes and the penal codes. As set out there in exhibit number 122, correct? Yes. Okay. And then if you turn to page 01248, what is that? Uh, it looks like examples that can be uh, put into case plans. 
and that's for general neglect, right? The template for general neglect. Uh, it says at the top of the page, yes. Okay. And if you turn over to the next page, there's a similar template for emotional abuse, right? Correct. And do you have an understanding that we use those same definitions for these templates as are depicted in exhibit number 122? That's my understanding. So this requirement that we use consistent definitions throughout the process of entering information in the CWS CMS system, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to sort of carry over into many different aspects of a case, is that right? Yes. It carries, number one, we know it carries over into the AFCARs, the funding requirements, right? Yes. Also carries over into the development of case plans, right? Yes. The, and also carries over into the substantiation or failure to substantiate specific allegations and investigation narratives. Yes. And that is a consistent definition, or those definitions are consistent from one purpose to the next throughout the CWS CMS system, correct? Correct. Okay. And when we say those definitions are consistent, we're referring to the definitions contained in exhibit number 122 at pages 2 and 3 of 25, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll show you another exhibit that we'll mark as exhibit number 130. Recognize exhibit number 130? No. Do you know whether or not the Orange County Social Services Agency has CWS CMS data entry standards? Uh, they do. You just don't recognize this particular exhibit as being um, some of those CWS CMS data entry standards? Uh, yes, I haven't seen this before. Okay. Looking down at the very bottom of the page where it says the placement facility type drop-down field becomes mandatory when an allegation category of caretaker absence in capacity, emotional abuse, exploitation, general neglect, and then a whole bunch of other things there. You see that? Yes. Okay those particular identifications of allegations, is that is this data entry standard another one of those areas where these consistent definitions depicted in exhibit 122 are used for you know multi purposes across different programs? What kind of type purposes? Mul multi. I don't know for a fact, but that would make sense that they would be. Okay, because we don't want to have different definitions from one service to the next, right? Correct. That would create chaos. Nobody would know what's going on with anybody, right? Yes. So we want to have consistent definitions from one program to the next, from one service to the next, right? Yes. And that's what you guys have in Orange County, right? Yes. Now, I struggle with this one because we've been talking about all day my vision going bad, but I'll show it to you anyway. Maybe your eyes are better than mine. Uh, what page is this? <clears throat> all right, I'm going to show you exhibit number 134, which is titled CWS CMS Child Welfare System Case Management System Training Materials Developed by Riverside County. And it's Defendant Production 005587. I'm going to show you the specific page because I'm virtually certain you haven't seen this training material before, but you may have seen the page before. What page is that? Let's see. Zero zero five five eight seven. Five five eight seven. 
What exhibit number was that again? 134. 134. I need to get my, anyways, get my glasses out. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't bring mine. It was a mistake. Are those the Costco ones? Yeah. 1.25? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, that's what I got, too. They're a good deal. They give you, like, three pair for 19 bucks or something. So, anyway, if you could look at page number 05587, particularly uh, number 5, there's a picture of a screenshot there. You see that? It's a little unclear, but I do see a picture of a screenshot. A little difficult even with my glasses to read what it says, so. though. So you're sympathetic with me. I can barely see it. Yes. Um, my real question here is, we talked earlier about the CWS CMS system and how it's computerized, and there's a bunch of drop-down menus and buttons and checkboxes, things like that. Remember that? Yes. That screenshot that's depicted at exhibit five do you recognize that as being the or a depiction of the screen as you would see it in the cws cms system uh it looks like it came from cws cms okay I'm not sure which screen that is though yeah i can't even read it but it looks like a cws CWSMS screenshot. The way they format it, at least. Right. And am I correct that because CWSCMS is a statewide system operated by the state of California, that its appearance, I mean, from one system to the next is uniform, at least as far as you understand it? As far as I understand it, that's correct. Okay. All right. Okay, I think this is the last one we have. Exhibit number 133. Like my pile's getting messy here. Yeah. Do you recognize exhibit number 133? Uh, didn't quite yet. No problem. Let me ask a different way anyway. Do you know what exhibit number 133 is? Um, it's a uh, titled All County Letter uh, that was sent down to uh, the counties by the Department of Social Services Calif by the state of California. Okay, an all county letter. Do you know what that is? Uh, it's my understanding that when the Department of Social Services, the State Department of Social Services, uh, makes any changes or anything they want counties to implement, they send it down in this format. Okay. Have you reviewed all county letters before? I have. Okay. This particular all county letter, it says the enactment of Assembly Bill 636 placed increased importance on the need for accurate, timely, and complete child welfare services data. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. Do you recall, and you may not, do you recall sometime in 2007 there being a particular emphasis in the County of Orange on increasing the um, accuracy and timely complete reporting of data into the CWS system. I don't recall that. Okay. The next sentence says the Child Welfare Services Case Management System is the primary source of information for the quarterly county data reports for the California Child and Family Services Review for each child welfare agency. First, did I read that correctly? You did. Is this one of the reasons, is that it's the primary source of information for these reports? Is that one of the reasons that you guys are required to accurately identify and insert information into the CWS CMS system? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't heard of this before. Okay. That's basically it. Let's do this. Let's take a five-minute break. We are off the record at 4.58. It's fast.
Uh, we are back on the record at 5.03. Oh, yeah, we're done for the day, or actually forever, with this witness. Uh, this concludes today's videotape deposition of uh, Colleen Hunch, taken on November 16, 2017. We are off the record at 5.03.